Room, room. Hey, everybody. This is Perch. I'm here with Joe and Larry. Hey, guys. How are you doing? All right. How are you? Doing well. Yeah. It's a, it's a night for Grant Morrison. So <laughs> <laughs> we uh, we did, the, of course, the Astonishing X-Men uh, retrospective, and that was fun. Uh, and despite all that, remember, I, I we kind of trashed the book, but we both still liked a lot of it. Because yes. That, yes, yeah. we did. So Larry reaches out and is like, we got to do the Morrison X-Men and, and Joe and I are game. It's always fun. I think I remember really loving this uh, when it initially came out. That was my memory anyway. How about, how about both of you? Yeah, I, I read this um, after Astonishing. Uh, I got the trades because um, I had jumped into X-Men for Astonishing. And then it was like everyone, you know, was like, oh, if you, you got to go back and, and read Grant's new X-Men. It's, it's crazy and it's, it's hip. And um, I was like, I, I'm a hip, young, single man in my 20s. I, I couldn't get down with this. <laughs> and, uh, and I did, and I, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I got the omnibus, which is how I read it uh, this time, uh, signed by Frank Quitely. So oh, uh, nice. Nice little, uh, little set here. And um, yeah, Larry, you just say how you feel. I don't worry. Yeah, how did, how did you, how do you remember that? <laughs> What happened, what happened is, uh, I remember I was in middle school, of all things, and I first came across Grant Morrison with the JLA when they were producing the JLA trade paperbacks for his yeah. run, where, where it was the like two or three issues, four issues, little, like $10 trade paperbacks. Yeah, yeah. And I bought one that was water damaged for like five bucks from someone. And I read it repeatedly till the pages started falling out because of the binding. And so when I'm reading Wizard and hearing Grant Morrison, I'm like, oh, the JLA guy is going to be coming on the X-Men. And I'm like, X-Men at the time was a trash fire. You had, you did have the costumes, like the black, they had the black leather. People forget this, the LaRocca, the Claremont LaRocca stuff. Yeah, local yeah, and yeah. everything. And like Cyclops is all brooding on a motorcycle. And it was just terrible. It's like when LaRocca started going more realistic in his artwork, which to me, when you get cartooning, great. He, like the Avengers Forever. But this is a, yeah. He's, yeah. He's, he's, he went down a bad road. But so I'm excited. I'm here. Okay. Wow, this Frank Quell, this is some weird looking art. And I'm like, I'm like, I kinda like it. And yeah. so I picked up the first issue of the uh, New X Men number one fourteen. And I actually picked it up at Heroes Con in uh Charlotte, North Carolina when it came out back in uh two thousand one. And blew me away. I actually read it at the oh my what? This is insane. Like I thought this was amazing. Like the art was incredible. I like the concept of the whole, you know, the, the evolution. And I even took that comic with me. I went to a Hardy's and it had comics. I was, I was actually reading it at, at the Hardy's and there was they were delivering they got up at the Hardy's delivered uh uh the my meal to me, which is weird. He said, like, What's that? So yeah it's excellent. What? Beast yeah. looks like a beast. He just looks like a blue wolverine. Well, I mean, this is great. I gotta pick this up. And he's like he was like just I was what actually thinking about giving it to him, but he's like, I he's like, I haven't read the X-Men comics for forever. I gotta pick this up. Like a, a random guy at party. So it's like this felt like this like a change in the air. And I was Isn't excited. It? And I was I picked up every single month. And I and like spinner racks, comic book stores, wherever I could get it. They didn't have it at the drugstore, because there's a drugstore I was picking it up still. Boondocks, North Carolina. I still but I was excited. Yeah. Reading the oh, omnibus? Yeah. Not so excited. <laughs> well, that's it. That's yeah. it. Well, so I, I had the same. It was, it was a cool take on the X-Men. They'd kind of been languishing for a while. Um, but you see this first piece of promo art. You've got, you know, Cyclops is looking. Everybody's looking kind of very leathery. It's, it's very, very punk. You're wondering how Emma's top is staying on. There's a lot of questions. But... Then, you know, so I, I remember being excited about this. I remember having fond memories for this. So I go back and I read it to get ready for this, like like both of you did. And um, it it hasn't aged well. <laughs> Maybe it's the best way to put it. No. And, and I mean, uh, and, and to put it in context, to kind of follow up with some of what Larry and, and you were also saying, Perch, is um, the 12 is considered by many people to be one of the lowest points that X-Men had hit. Yeah, that it was, you know, a, a fairly universally panned story. Um, so y this kind of takes off right after one of the absolute low points in X history. It does. And um, and part of this omnibus, you get the little notes of Morrison's pitch here at the end. And I'd love to know, did we ever find out who was writing the little handwritten notes in this? Because that person sounded like a complete douche. Yeah, that was... Um... 
That was, uh, it wasn't, it was Mark Powers. Oh, Mark Powers. Okay, well, I feel bad for Mr. Powers. But it, um, yeah, he, he adds nothing to this. He does draw a little star in some areas, though. Uh, I yeah. like this just just for reference. Uh, you know, Morrison's talking about doing some stuff with uh, Colossus, with Moira, and other things. And I love this line: Colossus and Moira both died recently. If we're to get away from the elements that are static aseptic, they have to stay dead. The X Men like us no law. <laughs> <laughs> you asshole. clearly they know nothing. Clearly, like, I do. X Men no loss. Jean Grey is coming and gone. This character's coming and gone. Like it. it the idea of loss in the X Men universe is a joke. Was a joke then? Is a joke now? Uh, yeah, yeah. I love how they immediately followed up this this uh, Morrison's run with uh, Whedon's as well, where they immediately bring Colossus back. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, a part of part of the frustration here, and I think a lot of us, if we read the manifesto, it was after we read the book, right? So, so reading this in the back, and the whole pitch that Morrison sets up, and very similar to Whedon. Yes, he utterly fails at every single thing he wants to do. Yes, he does. He yeah. he's setting up. He's like his whole point of this pitch is I'm going to bring the X Men back to how they were in the Claremont Burn era, while yeah. also selling like Jim Lee's X Men number one. Yep, by being more in line with the movie and then he gives the pitch like the movie he saw was like i don't know a racer head yes and was like oh a racer head this is a really weird chapter in x-men let's follow this up yeah he he of course he didn't get the sales of the jim lee era it didn't read like claremont and it really didn't resemble the movie at all no, um, he he doesn't even opt to use char- a lot of the characters from the movie. Like he he never uses Rogue, who was like the yeah. character who was supposed to be the POV character for the movie. Right? He, he wanted to kill her off, correct? He wanted to kill her he off. Did. But, you know, the um, I actually read the manifesto before. Yeah. yeah okay. Because mm-hmm. I wanted to say, okay, let me let me get in the mindset of having like, all like it's like here's the war plan. It's like. You know, everybody has a plan until they get hit. You know that kind of thing. It's and it, yeah. it felt like that. And you know, kill off Rogue for a new, like basically what he did with Angel. You know, a nastier, younger, punker version. You know that kind of thing. You know, yeah. the rebellious and no redeeming quality. You know, with that, it, it, if that had happened, it's like let's kill Rogue off and, and put a newer Rogue. And it's like, uh, well, thankfully yeah. that didn't happen. He actually pitched, no joke. To kill off Rogue to have a new goth girl Rogue. And he specify well, they specify in the pitch that what they wanted to do was bring in a, a character who was more distant and cold because, and I, I'm, you know, paraphrasing, but they basically say because a, a woman with those powers, like, wouldn't have self-confidence. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love that I mean, part. Ouch! Yeah, that that. But yeah, the brazenness of that, like that right there, goes to show like these are supposedly enlightened people, very you know cosmopolitan, you know, they are this, that, whatever. Supposedly, and that's my assumption of it. Now you should never assume, you know. But the brain dead nature of this, it's like, oh, because she can't touch nobody, she'd be closed off and be goth and be sad all the time. I love the fact that it's the contrast, like. She, Rogue loves who she is, but she she knows deep down like she can never be truly happy. But it's not like it's the mask that she wears. It's it's a, like Lobdo was doing a better writing job on this character than the way they treat these people. It's it's painful. I mean, you read through his manifesto and you just get line after line of very kind of you know you wince reading some of this. Like, and plus, I, I it it does lend some question. Like, how does Morrison see himself exactly? Because he writes this of. These stories will be accessible, punchy, and modern. Everyone can agree we can no longer be afford to be bogged down by convoluted continuity. And it's like, ha- have you read your own work? Like, I mean, it, it, it's fine. I'm, I'm a big fan of a lot of things Grant Morrison has done, but accessible would not be the word I'd use to describe this. No, and, um, <laughs> this is not an exception. I, I mean, other parts of the manifesto include, uh, what was it, a Magneto... Um, in disguise, uh, still like murdering like Moira. Oh no, it was uh, Cassandra Nova murders Moira, but at this point she is referred to as Charlie X in the pitch. Sure, 
And then, like, Magneto resurrects Moira as, like, uh, a puppet by manipulating, like, the iron in her body. Yeah. Yeah. Like, what? What the heck? And, and, and it was, like, it was talking about, like, early on, Morrison's talking about, like, you know, characters needing to, like, there needs to be, like, some weight to deaths. And then you read the manifesto, and it's like, we kill off Moira really quick and then bring her right back. Yeah, yeah, he does. I mean, all through this, I mean, he wants to build, like, the beats in the story he wants to build are really strange. He, he wanted to do a story where Wolverine tracks down Gambit and they sit in a bar to work it all out, which is is kind of he got a repurpose with Cyclops. But anyway, it's it's a very strange. Like sometimes you read these manifestos, it, it helps kind of clarify certain parts of the book. You read this one, and it's like what the hell. <laughs> and also, uh, Morrison makes it very clear the only reason the Shi'ar show up in this is because they only read a handful of trades. Um, before taking this over, and you know, Claremont and Byrne dealt with the Shi'ar, so right. so that's why it comes up. But y- you know, um, people complain today about feeling like creators didn't read the source material before taking over the books. Morrison not only states that they did not read the past twenty years of X Men in this official pitch to Marvel. Yes. They also say, and there is nothing they can do to get them to read it. Yes. Yes. I, I the, the, the balls of like, I'm not going to pay attention. What's funny is early in the pitch, he talks about wanting to get the sales of the 90s. And then later in the pitch talks about he will not read those comics. Yeah. I it, Okay. <laughs> I mean, and, and, and the way Grant talks about the era, like he... Grant also misses some of the points. Grant, like, kind of conflates the Claremont Byrne error. Like, um, it, it's like, you're also kind of talking about some of Cockrum and some of this other stuff, and you, you kind of just boil it down to just being the, the Claremont Byrne era because you just read a handful of trades that were available at the time. Because keep in mind, this is probably around 2000 when Grant's putting this together. Uh, to that maybe early 2001 and um you, you know there were not the same level of trades as, as there are now like you had the dark phoenix saga as a trade a few other things but yeah, there was not the, the essential x-men volume two which has the lead up into like it has you know dark phoenix and yeah. has the future past and that's it because that's yeah. what it feels like it's like if you're gonna read any of it read this and like and on granted that is amazing bit but there's more to it than that. There's a lot more to it. You know, the, it, Paul, when Paul Smith comes in, you know, Barry Windsor Smith doing his little cup of coffee for X-Men, but what he does yep. it makes a big impact. You have Magneto leading the team, you know, being held responsible. Like that, that's, it's like, oh, that none of that happened because he didn't read it. He didn't care. The idea, like, you know, the, the wrestling terms, the, the whole Morrison manifesto feels like kayfabe to me. It feels like someone, like they made it up after the fact. Now, probably isn't but it just it just read falsely to me it read like very like it was put a show on for people and the the idea of like you know the you know magneto going from you know you know from heel to face heel to face back and forth young old this that would it it, you gotta have some it it felt like grant had no reverence for x-men in general like i mean like yeah Yeah. i like the x-men it's like hey do you like the x-men yeah yeah i like the x-men it's like but you can't really what I like about the X Men, I like the fact that you know, they're, okay, I, you know, that, the whole go off the rails. But I'm just saying, there didn't seem to be that reverence in the work, and that's like from the jump, the idea of just boom, here you go. Oh, they're 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 killing a sentinel, saving this you know pig faced three faced guy. You know, it's well, yeah, I mean, yeah. Speaking of the comic, so it, the comic it opens up with this this three part story, which was kind of that was refreshing. At least we didn't start out with a deconstructed like twelve issue, you know, tale. They're not looking for swords. That's nice, but yeah, um, <laughs> it, it uh, we we get this. It, it's a fairly tight first three issues, but then there's some other odd parts. It, the whole goal of this is to introduce Cassandra Nova. We don't really know exactly who she is, but she's going to activate these sentinels and it's bad. And we're kind of getting the status quo. And as you mentioned, there's this, this weird mutant that Wolverine and Cyclops are playing around with. Uh, We get the whole, you know, we we get this whole kind of introduction, but in our second issue, which comes out on um, 
the first week of September, uh, September 11th, we get the Sentinel blowing up uh, Genosha with buildings falling down and everything else. And this, this came out one week prior to 9-11. See, that right there. Like, I, I mean, it, it, it couldn't have, you didn't know, obviously, it was going to happen. Course, yeah. had some timing. It was, like, people said it was in the zeitgeist and everything. Before that, I, I just want to say that I will, I, even with the, like, media, in media res fighting the Sentinel, it's old model and this and that, whatever. Like, the idea of ev- evolving. He hammer, you know, Grant does hammer home the evolution aspect. You know, Beast's secondary mutation, the uh, idea that even the Sentinels are mutating, the evolving as well. Yeah. And, you know, the school is going from, we're just, you know, not that many people at the school. You might have the new mutant class, but we're going to actually have a lot more sc- students, you know, just kind of people in the background, the cuckoos and what have you. But like you know, more like evolving the concept, but they never really go full tilt with it. But yeah, one fifteen, one sixteen with the whole nine eleven imagery and the worst. Um, like it's leading up to it, where you see like the Times Square thing and people running and the, the, the pyroclastic flow, and then you pull back and pull back as Xavier. All the numbers are dwindling, and you're seeing the smoke plumes, and that's ex- like when like the you know, uh, aerial f- satellite footage and stuff and mm-hmm. from that and it was like and then the whole you know beast's gallows humor and the, rub- the rubble yeah. i just found very crass yeah. that is not beast. Yeah. Joe, what no. you, you had that same comment like beasts is really off here no but it doesn't even feel like beast uh, i i mean throughout this whole comic this is not beast um, but like when, when you're reading this, I mean, it, it's written like a, a 17 year old edge Lord who got in trouble in high school for trying to photocopy, uh, poems about, uh, killing themselves and we're in, you know, like, you know, the, um, the therapist's office in the school, the guidance counselor, whatever it is like, this is what it reads like. I, I mean, you have the professor X, you know, with the gun to his head, uh, threatening, uh, to kill himself if Cassandra Nova tries anything, which makes no fucking sense because uh, she could just you know take over his body and he can't do it. That you know, it's, I don't even understand why why that's the case. I don't understand why Cassandra Nova is walking around with Boulevard Trask's like nephew, who's a dentist. It's stupid. I actually I I. I, I will defend both that because I actually like the idea. Like it is very visual, yes, very trashy. The mm-hmm. I will kill myself. I will deprive you of the most powerful weapon on the planet, my brain. I like that kind. Of, I liked it. I it's trashy. It's like okay. not say guilty pleasure, but I'll just own up to how trashy it is. But I also liked the idea of that why they would not allow any humans in the uh, you know I, when I'm gr- reading it again, mm-hmm. and it's kind of clear that with Cassandra Nova because just a basically a fetus monster that takes the form of a you know cassandra nova's look yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and this idea is like having to in- integrate and be around you know larry was not larry trask uh uh but yeah the, the trask uh yeah, Omar, the yeah. and then uh, being around him to integrate his dna into that amoeba body so it can't you know so cassandra can control the sentinels and you know Take out and make the four sentinels go out the four master molds and then go and and I didn't never picked up on the first my first read that they, they go to Johannesburg and strip mm-hmm. Johannesburg all the metal then go to Genosha and yeah. basically make themselves bigger. I like the idea that they're you're, they're not just going there directly to Genosha. They're going to they're going to arm up. They're going to tool up like you know uh, Arnie and Commando just go to the gun grenade this that whatever to go kill mutants. Yeah, no, I, I mean. The idea of, of Charles doing something like that with, with the gun to his head, it, it, while it's an interesting visual, which I think Grant puts the inter- interesting visuals over anything that makes any sense, the, the problem is y- you would think that Cassandra Nova could take him over in an instant. Oh, so, yeah, sure. like, yeah. what, uh, like it, it, it doesn't make any sense. It's, it's like you can't, you wouldn't be able to stop it. If anything, you now have a gun and can murder the people around you. <laughs> yes. You know, so so like that's the part there, and and the stuff with like the idea of Trask's nephew, like like all of that, like the idea of, of her needing like Trask DNA and stuff like that. That's fine. I uh, that part of the idea, making it like a nephew and making it like why would they be caring about the nephew's 
DNA? Why do they care? Why do they care about Trask DNA to that point? Like there, there were just like a lot of things where it was just, it felt too much like, oh, I want to do this cool thing. And it's like, yeah, but like, if you think about it for more than a second, like how, how distant of a relation to Trask because like, I guarantee you the nephew's DNA way different than Bolivar Trask's DNA. So I don't really know what they're going for. I, I don't know why, I don't know why they would be programmed to listen to his nephew. You, you know, like th- there was just stuff like that, that I'm just like, well, what are you doing? Like if Grant, can't, if Grant can't be bothered to read like more than like 12 issues of X-Men, he probably can't be bothered to understand how DNA works. So <laughs> Yeah. It, it was just, you know, that, that kind of stuff was, was really weird. Um, and, and Cassandra just being a very, like, I rem I feel like I I remembered her having more of a point, but she's basically snidely whiplash trying to tie all of mutant kind to the railroad tracks. Yeah, yeah there's not a a big. She doesn't have a, a big driving force. She's just kind of like Freddy Krueger type villain. Uh, she taunts. She goes off. I mean, it, there's 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 not a big plan here. There's never a big plan here. No, and, and then on top of that, like go, going back to the original idea we, we were talking about with Genosha and and all of that, there is like over a year in this comic where they barely mention Genosha. It feels like they start bringing it up again much later, like in like the late one thirties, one forties, where people really start referencing it again. Yeah, I, that's it. So that's exactly it. so. We have three issues, and it's it's quick and short. And I do appreciate that it was three issues uh, yes. again, today. In today's time, this would be twenty, and um, and we get Frank quietly doing some art. I think some pretty solid art. I, I like quietly. I think he's he's a pretty good guy that we are promised yeah. more than quietly. Um, and then we immediately move into uh, this kind of introduction of Zorn, I believe. Um, yeah, it's, it's like annual. that annual. Yeah, yeah, you. that widescreen garbage. I hated that when I read it initially years ago, and reading an omnibus where you have to turn. Th- it's oh yeah. god, it's terrible. It's it's an idea that didn't. It's it's. I get the idea. It's it's not a bad idea. It's an idea that does not work though. <laughs> yeah, but like, um, and again, it's like it, it would have been nice if, if Grant read more X Men because um, you know what. Um, the Sentinels have evolved. This isn't a new story. We've seen the it. Sentinels, the Prime Sentinels with the Zero Tolerance, where they're people. Yeah. yeah. All it's, kinds of different things. Yeah, they, they've done this before. You know, and then um, and the U-Men. Again, it's not like, this isn't as interesting as you think, buddy. You know, it's, it's well, like... I mean, we get into this next issue, and it, it brings in... So, first of all, Quietly's gone. We've got Van Skyver in. And well, yeah, well, you're skipping over the the annual though the yeah, whole the annual, uh, which is very important for later. Yeah, because the whole idea. Oh, yeah, I went. I went too is Magneto. Like we, we're oh we're gonna we're gonna reveal the oh, villain. That's gonna, yeah, yeah the, there you go. Sorry, it's fuller for twenty year old, nearly twenty year old comic. This but is, this this is I read, Francis you right doing the art on this. Yes, yeah, so this is Lionel Francis you. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And going into it with the knowledge. Okay, so there's supposedly hints that. Zorn is really. Uh, excuse me. Uh, he, his mind is red. You're seeing. You're you, you've, you're seeing him as a young man, uh, accidentally vaporizing things with his mind, and then and then you're seeing visions. So you're clearly reading his mind. Gene is reading his mind, not some scrub telepath. We're talking the number two telepath on the planet behind Xavier, and we're seeing there is his visors opened up. He vaporizes people. The prison's built around him, so somehow between you know Magneto's supposed death because we see him in the tower in Genosha in the wheelchair. Yep. Mm-hmm. So between so either that was a clone or maybe another changeling or some kind of copycat character, what have you. So his plan, his big plan. I'm going to go to China with my supporters. I'm going to build a prison. I got I got a corrupt Chinese guard, and we're gonna. I'm gonna go in there. I'm gonna kill mutants, uh, vaporize them with powers I've never experienced before, never shown before. Somehow magnetic thing that vaporizes people. I'm going to take this helmet off, and so everybody on the on the cliffside gets to see my sun for a brain and the skull fragments floating with behind in front of that skull, and enjoy the sunshine and the X-Men 
see this. I'm going to, you know, learn, like, and then I'm not going to join them right away. I'm going to go away to a ton of monastery and they're going to have to come and get me. This was very, oh God. The whole, it could have been Magneto at this point. Could it? I mean, I understand the way you're setting up, but there's, there, it, it, it makes like you just identified. I, I mean, yeah, but, but Magneto even says later on, he created that prison to keep himself in as a trap. Yeah, it, that makes no sense at all. And, and he, yeah. and he, the, somehow he has a bill like, with his helmet. Understand no, being able not to read his brain. And if she said, "Oh, I can't read his mind," like okay, that right there because Magneto. Mm -hmm. But oh, I read his mind. I saw visions of him as a child. So somehow he is this. This makes less sense than Metal Gear Solid Four, <laughs> which says the, because the whole oh uh, revolver uh, liquid liquid oscillate. He's really revolver oscillate liquid oscillate liquid. His brother died. The arm, yes, was there, but his spirit was, and he was. It was all uh, mind trickery and uh, you know, I would call it hypnosis that made him think that he was liquid ocelot. And this, it's this is some Koji, you know, uh, Kojima level uh, uh, garbage with this the whole like, oh, it's really the whole. It was insanity. Well, also Wolverine could smell Magneto. That's true. That too. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like all this stuff. And then I think this is the issue where they first introduce. Yeah, it is where they first yep. introduce the idea of the X corporation. Yep. Yes. And you get uh, Scott's potentially sleeping around with Emma too. So yep. you yeah, get a, you get a twofer there. What, what's, but <laughs> what's with Grant with the whole corporations? You have Batman Inc. You have yep. X corporation. It's like, he's you're doing the same idea over and over. Yeah, he does clearly, uh, or um, you, you know, they clearly keep using the same ideas uh, over and over. Um, in in fairness to Grant, here X Corporation is like barely touched on. Yes, um, which makes it more baffling that they used it at all B because there's no point. It never moves the story forward. No, it doesn't matter to any of the plot. Or, or it, and it, it's referenced, but then you kind of have to be reading the other X books at the time to more or less get the idea. It comes back again later with Phantom X, but it's it's really yeah. There's no there's no point to it. Yeah, there is. I mean, and back to the Zorn idea. I, just, I, I wrote down a note. I'm I don't, glad I read it real quick. There's a part in that story in the 2001 annual where there's where somehow Magneto is simulating the effects of a black hole by bending light. And absorbing things like sucking things into a black hole. So somehow, he, if he if he's like, yeah, and I, with the, it's like you, you need the total recall reveal. Oh, Benny was with me, and this is that. You know, this has all been a you know been a ruse. You know, you're you're Hauser the whole time. You know, <laughs> you yeah. know. I, I don't get it. Um, yeah, and, and and also again, like the U men are set up here, and they periodically show up and. They're never a real threat. No, they're they're just kind of there's a there's a corporation. I mean, the, the the simmering plot in the background, which we do get in the next issue, is that we we get the reveal that Cassandra Nova swapped places with. They've done a Freaky Friday, and and she's in you know Professor X's body, and you know there's a few jokes about the Beast, but then you get a lot with the human. It is the introduction of Angel and Beak, yeah, and the the Cuckoo Twins, I guess. Yeah, okay. I think um, we we get the cuckoos. We get um, we get the the protests at the school, which also just disappear after a while. It's never resolved. They get tired, uh, you know. They just stop protesting after a while. It's, I mean, yeah. It's it's this whole bit with the human is strange, and then we get a change of art from Ben Skyver off to Igor Cordry. Yes. Who stays on for quite a while? And again, these styles don't don't blend. Not not like that's the biggest thing we have to worry about here. But these these styles don't don't blend nicely from one to the other. No, and, and also like I, I don't know about you, but it's a little weird to me that um, these protests are going on without any local government intervention at all after a genocide. <laughs> the likes of which that have never occurred in the history of our planet has happened. <laughs> well, that like your point was, they have completely forgotten about that. Like, like they go many, many comics, uh, ignoring the fact that you know the mutant race has been pretty much wiped out, or a big portion of it. 
I mean, um, if um, and this launch, like this attack launch from, I think it was what Ecuador for uh, with the where they found the master mold yeah, and launched the attack right. from there. Yeah. In any reality, the U.S. and Russia would be rushing on who invades Ecuador first <laughs> after Ecuador sure. shows it has the power to instantly annihilate sixteen million people. <laughs> That's what happens to that ma- the the master mold the that master mold is never touched upon again. No, it's it, it, that's a crazy. It's still down there because uh, more recent comics have like, like they've showed up back down in Ecuador. It's like oh, this thing's still here. It's it's really fine. <laughs> You're telling me, this is before Fury's, uh Exile after that horrible Secret War miniseries. Uh, that sure. beautiful painted art, terrible story. Uh, but before Fury's Exile, so Shield was still a thing. The fact that they didn't know this existed. This giant sentinel master mold sitting, not even in the jungle, covering it. Now, yeah. That would be interesting if they do like there's trees growing on top of it. But no, just sitting there. In it's all only- fairness, the U.S. government has never interfered with South America. <laughs> <laughs> Banana nice. Republic, what? Huh? Nice. You know, South and Central America has always been off limits. Yeah, we well, maybe that's really respect the national uh, borders and international rights. <laughs> yeah, it, it's possible they carried that storyline over to Captain America. We just missed it. Um, That'd been interesting. <laughs> sure, why not? Um, it's it's yeah, but um, so so now there's there's protests because um, yeah, people wouldn't be viewed as heartless for protesting uh, outside the mansion immediately after 16 million mutants were instantly wiped off the map. No, no, that's all good. It's uh, no, no, no problems at all with that. And and just the whole bit seemed to be leading up. They really wanted Emma and Jean to go out and confront the protesters. That felt like the entire point of the entire protest scene. Because yeah, after Emma gives them all, what she gives them all an orgasm, basically, and then we don't. They they just kind of like you said, they, they just disappear at that point. Yeah, and, and then um, we have to have a scene where where Jean and uh, Wolverine kiss to undercut the entire infidelity storyline later with uh, Scott and Emma. That's right. Yeah, I, I there. They, that's another scene where it made me wonder if he kind of forgot he wrote that because, as you said, the the, the plot here is about Scott cheating on Jean and and the Emma relationship and what's going on here. But they put this kiss in very early, and it. Yeah, like you said, it, it just it undercuts the whole business. And then they all get sick. Yeah, they all get sick, uh, which is weird because Colossus just cured the legacy virus like literally months ago at this point still. Like, that was what? Um, X-Men like 110 or something like that? Like in that area? Like it was 108 or 109. 109. Yeah, it was within a year. Yeah, it was within a year. Yeah, well, yeah, it was within a year, and like they already did it again. Wolverine's sick this time too. Well, I even have symptoms too. Mm, something's up. Yeah, everybody's yeah. catching the flu, and uh, and then and then that that leads us to this issue that won awards, I believe. This silent issue, which was no words, uh, the the telepathic and you know uh, crawl into Xavier's mind, kind of get out what they've done. So finally, is this remembered that that Hickman just did kind of a redux of it in um, in his in his series in giant size, and this is considered. I see it pop up on many places as one of the top ten issues of X Men that you must read in your life. And I mean, visually, it's nice. They got out of paying the letter. That's cool. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that was. Uh, I'd have to double check, but I'm pretty sure that's the month they fired all the in-house letterers and, and outsourced. I mean, they kept a lot of the letterers. They just changed them from being staff to, you know, being their own kind of company. So I'm pretty sure they all got fired, and then they all got called immediately the next day and rehired in a different capacity. Yeah. What? I think that was around. I never heard of this. Th- that is some. That is some independent contractor. That's some shady stuff, right there. <laughs> no, like, no, absolutely. I, I know <laughs> people personally that that were involved in that. So that's that's how I know that. Oh but God. um, you know, we're also skipping. You know, we did skip the stupid issue where the whole point of it is that Beak has a bat he wants to give to Beast. Oh yes, that's right. For no titanium reason. Bat. Yeah, titanium for... bat. For some reason, it's like, where did he get this? Why? And it's like clearly, this is not going to be a plot point later. 
But it, it's the it's the stupidest thing. It's like the whole thing is he's like he's got to give him a bat, and it's not even like a cute kind of story of like you know like that's the the bat that Beak's dad used to own because because Beak used to dad used to be a pro uh, baseball player, so nothing like that. He's just like Beak is a bat. He wants to give to Beast. And why? That, why? Yeah. yeah, exactly. What? <laughs> why is it titanium? Why is it? No, I understood if they had instead of the whole beast chasing beak scene, it was like beast and beak playing ball or something like something because X Men and baseball that is a very common thing during the Claremont era. For sure, but the idea of just oh here's a baseball bat for no reason. If you had like a baseball jer- like a you know he had like a you know I don't know Ty Cobb jersey or something like someone like, oh maybe a little weird like oh something's a little, something's a little off about this guy this beat character and that, or something that indicate maybe he's a baseball fan and that maybe he wants to play but he's afraid his arms might break or something and oh this is a maybe if Beast made him the bat there you go like Beast made him the bat it's like oh this is a titanium bat but it's very balanced and easier to swing because you don't really have muscles on your arms but it allow you to hit the ball like anybody else yeah. You know, like, there you go. I actually improved the story. That's what the editor should do. Way too much there. So certainly more than Morrison. Uh, and and this is, more the this, editors. Is, this is all going on while Morrison is aping off uh, that little bit from the first X Men movie where Wolverine and like Rogue are briefly traveling together, but it's Wolverine and, and Angel. And it's just like the X-Men movie if Rogue was an insufferable, completely unlikable character you couldn't wait to have disappear. <laughs> exactly. I hated Angel so much. None I, of I, charm. I, Terrible character. And uh, there's actually, as I'm flipping back to it, also we get the amazing scene where uh, Morrison does decide to tap back on continuity, reference Hank dating Trish, which had been set up by, I think, Louise Simonson way back in the day in X-Factor. Yeah. Um, but we get the most awkward voicemail of, uh, she's like, ah, oh, you know, you look at me like I'm prey. The inquirer ran a story about us. The word bestiality was used three times and she breaks it off with him basically. And this, this matters cause it comes up later. Oh yeah. It comes up later when the whole, uh, oh, I'm, uh, what was the quote? Uh, was it not intended? Uh, where is that? Uh, oh. I think I might be. Uh, in fact, I think I might be gay. Yeah. And, like, and then admits later on, like, oh, I, I just said, I just want to be like a role model for people. That makes it worse. No, no, he, he's he, he kind of cops <laughs> the screwing with her. When, like he's he's just trying to kind of hurt her. So I mean, yeah, this is it, not a, the ex Avenger <laughs> beast. This is this is dark. This is this ain't even dark beast. At least dark beast more character. <laughs> yeah, but but before we get to there, yeah, the sorry, Empire. Empire. Oh yeah, back. yeah, yeah. The 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 Shi'ar, um, because Grant read about the Shi'ar in um, the Dark Phoenix Saga trade he had, or uh, you know they had, and uh, yeah, it's just uh, oh god, it it drags on the the Shi'ar. So I don't know what they were thinking, what they wanted to do with the Shi'ar, other than have them show up because it feels like forever. Well, well, okay. So Cassandra's plan is okay. Get the DNA from the get the trans DNA to activate the, the sentinel, Master Mole Sentinel, send sentinels mm-hmm. to Genosha to kill mutants. Okay, done. Okay, why is done while everybody's like distracted by the destruction? Get the X Men, the team, like somehow attract the team because they're they were in Australia, a separate mission that had nothing to do with Cassandra. Get brought to the mansion, get to the mansion, you know, act like oh, I'm a run running rough shot. Oh, jump mines. Then shoot my former body. Then contact the Shi'ar. Out, 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 out the Xavier is a mutant at the school's a school for mutants. And then call the Shi'ar, leave, control the Shi'ar Empire, and want to destroy the Earth of mutants and cure mutants. Not the fact that, um, excuse me, there are mutants in the Shi'ar Empire. They're galactic mutants. <laughs> there are yeah. mutants. Not, the, the people... That's the whole thing. The Shi'ar is like, yeah, we got Empire, a bunch of our mutants. They're part of the Imperial Guard. <laughs> but, like, why do you need to do the Master Mold stuff or anything if you can just skip to the point where you just swap bodies with Xavier and get the Shi'ar to wipe out all the mutants on Earth? Exactly. Exactly. Why, why just jump the fence? <laughs> jump the fence. <laughs> Yeah, I was okay what the plan really was with Genosha. I mean, it made for a hot opening arc, but then it didn't. It didn't really matter at all. Like she, she would have had a much easier time sneaking into the mansion, just taking over his, him, his body. I mean, like there's a lot of ways she could have been. She could have done this much simpler. 
the attack on Genosha was was super irrelevant all over the place. Yeah, and then we also, this is around where we get the really awkward Jean Grey speech where she talks about how uh, non-mutants like to pretend they're mutants because they love to be oppressed. Yeah, that, that age is great. Yeah, it's a really good time. Rachel Dolezal, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, oof, like what what are you what are you doing? Like, ah, oh, it's, it's well that so same speech weird. I found it like, this is just a weird thing I picked up. I didn't pick up the first time reading it was she mentions that Xavier got his mutant powers when he was eleven, that was thirty years ago. So Xavier's only forty one. <laughs> That's a haggard looking forty one for a- it's, a, it's a haggard looking forty one and I'm not exactly sure like I guess you had some mutants develop powers before puberty at this point, but it was still like exceptional to have something like that happen. But oh, yeah. that's the thing he, you know, the, uh, he tried to be, uh, so Cassandra technically had powers because, you know, he's trying to kill Cassandra and the whole energy beam, because com- I'm misremembering that. Uh, I, yeah, uh, no, you, it's no one's had powers from the womb. That's even a plot line in House of X Powers of Ten that if Moira dies before a certain age, she won't manifest her powers. Right, that's right. That's right. So, like it, it, it literally is impossible. The Cassandra Nova is an impossible character that can never exist. <laughs> no, and and I mean, I, yeah, they even they even put this in the movie that uh, he watched. I, I I mean, at this point, I'm pretty sure he was high and just really kind of liked the leather jackets, and that's pretty much where the movie ended. Yeah, but there's also an element to this where I, I don't want to put so much of this on on Grant because at the end of the day, this was Marvel being like, oh, you know what, Grant, we looked this over, and uh, oh, you said fuck you, and you know what, just fuck us, Grant. Please. <laughs> no, it is a team. It's always a team effort. We wind up talking about the creator, but somebody approved this. Somebody was writing little notes in his manifesto saying this is brilliant over and over. I mean, yeah, Mark Howard, it. whose whole job is to like basically protect the X line, is just like, oh, characters that, you know, everyone's like a mutant in the womb. Sure, why not? I mean, I've got absolutely perfect. Love it. Badass, this is as it should be. I mean, okay, they, they were they were on board. Am I misremembering this? I I want to say it was either Wizard or somewhere. I can't remember where. It might have been. I don't know. It might have even been Van Skyver himself. Somebody talking about how there was someone. It was a text or audio. I can't remember. But that Grant would wait to the last minute for editors to see any of the scripts and also artists as well, so they so he could basically have his vision unchecked and unchallenged. By because also I think there's like very few editors at Marvel at the time, like they were like doing way more books than normal. So basically, he was like waiting to the, waiting to the wire to slip it in so they can't you know change anything and have them go back and because it delay the book even further. I, I'm I'm pretty sure that was the case, and, and I'm sure a lot of artists would also probably back that up. But um, to kind of put things in perspective here uh, for people, um, just put it in the right time frame. You know, Grant was was a huge get for Marvel oh, at yeah. the time. This this was a big deal. Um, but the problem was Marvel was more interested in getting Grant than Grant's ideas, which is a weird situation that DC never ended up doing themselves many years right. later with another talent. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, we get yeah. No, 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 nobody springs to mind right there. No, 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 no other bald white person that I can think of. But um, <laughs> you know, it's you look at it and you look at Grant's body of work, and, and obviously, I, I mean, uh, they made a, a big impact in DC, and taking things away from DC really got the people at Marvel off for a long time, and I believe it still does. Oh, absolutely, it still does. I, I mean. Yeah, absolutely. I think that there's a there's a somewhere somewhere in the halls of Marvel there's like a, a gallery of photos of, of gits and they they do love rubbing DC's nose in it. And uh, there's probably a little bit of DC, although I don't get the same obsession there, but definitely at Marvel that is the case. Oh, yeah, and, and I mean and you look at it and um you see they didn't seem to like that many of Grant's ideas. I, I mean Grant basically got what was it uh 
Marvel Boy and Fantastic Four, one, two, three, four. And, and that was pretty much it outside of New X-Men. He had a lot of failed pitches. Uh, the Filth and Seven Soldiers of Victory were two of those failed pitches that they just brought to DC and had them do, I think, and this is probably lucky for all of us, that Seven Soldiers of Victory was originally going to be some sort of like Avengers offshoot book. Yeah. Oh, thank goodness that was not the case because I I picked it up. I picked that because I was like, yeah, Grant. You know, back when I actually was a Grant, I actually enjoyed more Grant Morrison's work before like Final Crisis kind of broke me, and I was like, you know what? Maybe he isn't so good. <laughs> sure, sure. And it was that I was like. This is not good. This is almost unreadable. This is almost unreadable. Even picking it up. Yeah, awesome. I, I liked it at the time. I, I don't. I still have the trades. I don't know if I'm going to go back or not. Yeah, but, don't, um, don't do it to yourself. Yeah, yeah. It, it very much. Even at the time, like reading the trades, like um, again, like I probably read the trades ten years ago. Is probably the last time. You know, it was one of those things where I read it and I was like, oh, it finally makes sense at the second to last issue. Yeah, but um, you had to go through almost all of it being like, they're going to tell me what's happening at some point, right? Like, <laughs> in, the, in the worst part, just like with Civil Soldiers of Victory, same thing here. There are ideas that, yeah, that's a good idea, but it takes, you know, like it, there's like so much, I guess, fat that's got to be trimmed away. So much just flotsam and jetsam, just get to the point. Like, oh, wow, Shiny Knight's really, a, really a woman. Really, a, 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 a female. Okay, cool. Same thing with like, oh, Zorn is not who we think he is, but then have to go, no, no, he's really Magneto. And, and it's stuff like that. It's like the, I, these ideas just seem to be like to drop the ball. And, and the whole Shi'ar, oh, we're going to use the Shi'ar to get rid of the mutant threat. I'm like, well, you have Cerebra. You can get in Cerebra and kill everybody with your mind. You don't need the Shi'ar. But- <laughs> It's it's tracking mutants. Like we've, if you watch the movie, um, I'm pretty sure you know. Like you, you know, touch every mind. Oh, if I can touch every mind, that means I can stab every mind or shoot every mind. Yeah, metaphorically. But like Cerebra makes less sense here because Cerebra's whole thing is that it's Cerebro but more badass. But then um, we're close to it, but not here yet. They introduce the drug kick. So right. it's like, why do you need Cerebra and Kick? That doesn't make it. You, you know, like, there's just all these things. It's like, why are you doubling up on, on so much of these things? Yeah. And, and then the way that they have the stupid fight that's a misunderstanding with uh, the Shi'ar, which is brilliant new material. The X-Men and the Shi'ar have never miscommunicated, uh, fought <laughs> each other, and then figured it out and worked against the real threat. Never oh. In the Never, ever, yeah. of the books, and then um, the the way they beat Cassandra Nova is like tricking Cassandra into going into the body of the stuff that like one cell giant Shi'ar guy. Yeah, uh, not um, was it not, ch- was it not Changeling? The the, the Legion of Heroes. Um, is it Changeling? Uh, the the one that changes shape. Legion of Superheroes. That's basically the character. Yeah, Chameleon um, Boy, yeah. Chameleon Boy, there you go. Yeah. Chameleon Boy. Yeah. Basically, yeah. Shi'ar version of Chameleon Boy, yeah. But, but Cassandra is, Nova... Cause, yeah, Cassandra Nova does that willingly, even though she has Professor X powers and could have scanned the mind of the body. <laughs> right. And Or any of the people around the body to kind of detect the trick, or you know, any of this stuff. I mean, she's She's taken over the entire Shi'ar. She's taken over the students. She's Wolverine has some very weird suspenders going on. There's there's just there's a lot here. She's basically commanding all of the Imperial Guard and Gladiator and and everything. Yeah, but, and, but then she's like, I'll just hop into this body over here. It's all good. But and, and we're never given a clear reason as to why she so desperately needs a physical body when that doesn't seem to be an issue because she's like murdering everyone. Sure. Yeah, it it and it doesn't bother her later in uh, Whedon's run either. No, it's all good. No, and and this leads us right into that um, one shot Zorn issue that was illustrated by Bill Sienkiewicz, which is completely undermined by the Magneto reveal later. Right. Yeah. This this exactly. So you get this one shot, 
And it is uh, a lot of kind of backstory of Zorn and, and him doing good things and all the rest kind of, you know, beating bowls of rice in the rain here. And, and, uh, but none of this, this, this whole story is a complete sham. And, and if, it, if the whole Magneto really take that out, the idea, like, okay, sowing the seeds for, okay, this is a guy who's been in prison for most of his life, he just wants to help people, but he's been forced to kill with his powers. Then he's like, you know, suicidal. He's going to cross the black hole. The X-Men talk him out of it. Say, hey, man, there's more to it than what you have right now. We're going to, we, we, we'll show you. And he's like, okay. And so he goes to kind of find, you know, center himself. He's been, he doesn't want to just join up right away. He goes to a monastery. And then, like, Cyclops shows up. Hey, let's go. And then the whole Shi'ar thing happens, and he gets ducked with Shi'ar, and he's there with. So he is he is there with the Shi'ar, and then you know eventually joins the school and has like the special class. He's a group group of misfits, group of people that have been hurt and been you know taunted and all, basically like him. And so what do these kids do? They taunt him and they they hurt him emotionally. But he's like, and then this one shot issue, like you said, this where these you know even in a such enlightened time, such enlightened people, they're still this. Like, give like one week, and this mutant would have, you know, gone gotten past this stage of his mutation. He'd become something beautiful, but you had to kill him. And like that right there could have been that turn towards a new a Magneto 2.0. This idea, yeah, and, and it would have been amazing. This idea of this guy, like he literally, like oh, oh, the Phoenix can destroy solar system. He's literally got a potential for a black hole walking around. It's a, yeah. something bright that could turn into something horrifying the black hole that is amazing and it's wasted and the story is pointless and I, uh, great art i love the artwork in it sure. that's the only thing i really like <laughs> I, I mean a, a lot of the art throughout the whole run is is good it's not consistent and it, it's not uniform right but but it, it's 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 solid work but then we cut to uh, Professor X, uh, you know, be, he's he's formally he's he's back now. It's it's the real Professor X. It's not Cassandra Nova. And earlier on, you kind of give everything sort of the benefit of the doubt. Like, okay, that's not really Professor X, so it makes sense that he'd abandon his students when they need him the most. Sure. Now we get uh, the real Professor X back, and he abandons his students when they need him the most. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the funny part is you don't notice a personality change. That was kind of, I mean, to, to the credit, I mean, the, the Cassandra Nova reveal was a good shock because they never changed his personality really ever. Yeah. And, and um, yeah, this, this whole issue, th this is where we get the, uh, we get Phantom X who uh, is super annoying in this run. Um, he, <laughs> Phantom X is that kid uh, we all used to play with in like elementary school who, whenever you played like superhero or something, always had a new power yes. um, and you could never beat him. Yeah. And if you played tag, he somehow you couldn't actually tag him. There were like, always shields that he's putting up. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he's Phantom X is that guy. Uh, it's it's <laughs> really it, like this time it was so grating reading that just he's just like i'm you have to help me i'm too badass it is i mean it, it's it's an interesting character design they go in later much later in the run to some interesting parts of his history but mm -hmm. it is hard to like this character because it is it is very much the i i can he's, he's too smart he's too perfect he just consistently stays always several steps ahead of everyone always yeah that's too many of grant morrison's characters he really like grant really leans hard on the idea in so many of their runs of oh no they're two steps ahead of us like yeah. that's way too much um it was really cool early on with stuff like doom patrol but when you start seeing grant just use that trope over and over and over again it gets yeah it, it, it gets old uh which also is now reminding me I think, oddly enough, Cyclops might be like the most likable character in this run. <laughs> I, I have to agree. Like the idea, it totally is, yeah, it, yeah. You know, I, and I feel like Cyclops is kind of analogous for the reader. You know, you've been put through, except <laughs> you've been put through misery, <laughs> and you know what? Uh, I feel bad for you. You know, you know, it kind of ends on a high note, but with the whole, you know, we'll get to that eventually. But the what was done with Cyclops in here. Wolverine really has nothing going on the entire 
really so far. Yeah. Even with the re- you know the reveal of the weapon, plus uh, he's not Weapon X, he's Weapon Ten, and uh, and I'm like, oh god, and, like oh. I I, <laughs> I hate that. And then the idea when the reveal with with Phantom X, like oh, and you know, like oh, he's supposed to be a mutant, a mutant killing badass. I'm like, he couldn't even get survive getting shot. <laughs> He needed he needed the X Men to keep him from getting killed. You're telling me that he's supposed to be this mutant killing badass? Like he's he's better than Weapon. Well, they they, they never they, could be. They simultaneously make him super capable and incapable at the same time. It is inconsistent. Quite a, <laughs> That's quite, the, a, quite a feat. Yeah, you know um, the the other thing here too is you're also dealing with okay. We already dealt with the Sentinels not that long ago. And now you're updating the weapons program to also be about killing mutants. Yeah, it's a signal program. Basically, that's what it is. It's just yeah. a variation. And then the idea of, you know, I, I was it done before the whole. I, I know Nuke and Captain America were connected from the uh, Frank, Frank Miller's Born Again run. Yeah. Uh, so like the you know we can't create the super soldier formula. We at least give them pills. You know. But the whole, like, oh, Nuke and Captain America, they're a part of the Weapon Plus program. And I'm like, G- give me a break. You're like, this is, I don't like that kind of, like, the, everything has to be connected. It's like when they connected yeah. uh, uh, Gateway to uh, Gateway to Bishop and Shard. Like, you did not have to do that. Like, you can have Gateway and you have Bishop and Shard, but you didn't have to connect them, you know, like, oh, they're, they're descendants of Gateway. It's like, no, you don't have to do that. No, I, I, absolutely. And, and also, uh, I need to stress this to everyone. in grant's own manifesto they stress in it they do not want to do anything with wolverine that wolverine's origin has been explored enough and then that becomes a huge portion of their run it's one of the like the three things that that we get out of this the update to the sentinels i guess whatever was going on magneto was immediately stripped away and then uh yeah and and then what they did to the weapon program with with wolverine it, it definitely um i i and and that was his conclusion as well. I, yeah, you're right. I mean, there's a lot, and I do think Cyclops is the character that is the reader because as you, especially you get into this next issue here where we get the affair, we briefly touch on more parts of X Corps and everything. Um, I mean, Cyclops is just kind of sitting there frowning. He's confused. Are we having some kind of weird affair? I don't know what's going on. And the end, he's like, "Yeah, okay, why not?" That is the reader kind of reading this whole run. Yeah. Yeah, we are Cyclops. That's <laughs> we are Cyclops. <laughs> but it, it's it. I actually and I the idea of you know Scott moved on past Gene when Gene died and then found Madeline and you know, got married. You know, had Nathan, lost Nathan, lost Madeline, lost Madeline, lost Nathan. Uh, you know, Gene comes back and you know, <laughs> it, it, it's like this. The, the Cyclops has been. I mean. He had to watch his parent. He thought his parents die. His mother died. Sure. Brothers, you know, the whole Vulcan thing, you know, retcon, whatever came after this. But the, you okay. know, s- separated from his separated from his brother for the longest time. Uh, you know, massive headaches. Can't really see with his own eyes. Like deprived of that, has to wear you know, keep from hurting people, and then gets recruited by some bald guy to be a weapon, you know, a child soldier. <laughs> you know, from an <laughs> orphanage, going around just abducting kids, like you know, getting kids to join his little private army to fight a concentration concentration camp survivor. You know, <laughs> it's it's, it's kind of weird. You know, we <laughs> pull it down. I know people have said that before. I'm not, mm-hmm. you know, new, it's not new ground, but th- and so uh, him moving on and getting over Gene's loss, and then Gene's back, and then in a, and they're like, oh, no big deal. We've are, we've had people inside our head. We, Gene is violating. The gene in here, but even before the whole Phoenix stuff shows up at the press conference where she kind of reveals that Xavier's only 41, where she goes and mind wipes all those reporters and civilians, like that's a, a complete violation, you know, of their of their individuality, their privacy, their their free will. And the, her doing that, and it's like not seen as a big deal. And then what she does, you know, going into Emma's mind and the trauma that she experienced. And it's like, you know, Emma's like, yeah, I got a nose job and everything like that. But then like, like just showing like, you know, exposing Emma's dark past to her family, you know, brother going crazy and sit in like basically a hateful, cold family. And like, like, don't do this to me. Like you basically, you know, don't. And then Gene just keeps doing it. Gene is the real villain. 
of, of the of the two. Like this is you know, um, um, excuse me, uh, Emma didn't destroy you know <laughs> well, that uh, Emma didn't destroy solar system. You know, oh yeah, she was a she was she was cold hearted, but oh, but she didn't destroy a solar system. And it jumps off definitely more sympathetic in this than Gene at, at many many different occasions. But uh, it's yeah, absolutely. And you also reminded me. Um, uh, this was another thing that was in the manifesto that sounded really stupid. And then Grant did it in the book. And it's also really stupid early on in that first arc, the whole thing with Cyclops uh, talking about like the Ruby contacts he wears uh, as like protection. That doesn't make any sense. He wouldn't be able to take those out. Exactly. I was thinking the same thing. Cause like, <laughs> I, 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 I don't wear glasses. I've, I've worn them in the past. I, mm -hmm. you know, but I've never put contacts in, but I understand how they work. You can uh, imagine him trying to fight, like his hand would be like being bombarded by like a kinetic, you know, blast. It would be on, your bathroom. It would be terrible. Yeah, bathroom. His hand would be beaten up and like, if, if, if very, very best beaten up, if not every bone in his hand broken from trying to put the. Unless he's got like some kind of ruby quartz glove like well, it's like a I secret glove. At, at one point although i doubt morrison was wearing i mean they didn't they reveal like like cyclops can't hurt himself like he and havoc can just unload on each other and it won't matter well i think that's like the brother brother thing but as far as like hurt like i'm yeah. pretty sure like, if he, he tilted down like he'd probably break his own leg if i think because hmm. I, I, I think it's like I, I know some like you say like the optic blast it's because of the force of energy it's kinetic energy so it's like it would cause potential fires but it isn't lasers but yeah. it's, it's like a bunch of fists it's like a, you know hitting you repeatedly but but yeah even then it's you're, you're gonna destroy your home property <laughs> around you like there there's no way to actually do it unless you know he was with someone like gene or emma who could suppress his power while i took it on and on and off and even then that wasn't the case or earlier when he took them out so it's like what are you doing it's it, yeah, it wouldn't be worth it. Yeah. I mean, I, I it's, it's no contacts are worth that. No, uh, <laughs> no. I so as, as our story marches on, we get we briefly return to Genosha. We remember that that place was was blown up, so that was nice. And we head back there, and it gives us an opportunity to get Polaris naked. And also, there's this whole bit where this statue kind of is created from the the, the rubble of the Sentinel, I believe. Isn't it? Or yes, the yeah. Sentinel's face. Right. Uh, this is the Toad Sentinel. and a couple other characters are putting together a memorial yeah. to, and, to and, Lord Magneto. And this is the Sentinel that would later kind of come out of the water in Astonishing X Men without Magneto's face, right? Um, yes, I, 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 I think it. so. Hmm. But, okay. but it was in the water, though. It was it was on land. <laughs> That's oh, the sure. <laughs> Why not? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But at the same time, there's also that awkward interaction where, like. Professor X claims that Toad knows Magneto better than him. Yeah, that's exactly. literally impossible. Yeah, <laughs> all the to all of this here is is terrible. I mean, we're yeah, absolutely. Um, it, that's wrong. Um, Polaris is strange, although you know this would be a good decade of strange for her. They, yeah, they, I was going to say this is actually in line with the Chuck Austin run. So that works. That's right. Chuck Austin learned from this run. That's uh, <laughs> hey, I, I will still stand by Kia Asamea coming on uh his the Uncanny X-Men. I also stand by uh Sammy and Juggernaut. That's the best thing <laughs> Chuck Austin has ever done. Oh no. <laughs> I, I love that. I, I love, you know, abusive fathers and like Sammy's like, yeah, I was gonna go shoot up my school. And I, I'm like, I, 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 I surprisingly at the time related. <laughs> no, 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 not the like, idea of the frustration, but not the literally doing oh, it. Yeah, yeah. Gotta, you know, wow, that's gonna be clipped yeah. out of context. <laughs> I, I read the, the Chuck Austin run over the summer, and, and honestly, I, I'm kind of in a weird, like, I, I don't know. I, I had, I at least had fun when I read that. Yeah. Like, uh, no at, least when, yeah. at least when uh, Paige Guthrie, at least when Husk and Angel are above having sex above the Guthrie homestead, and everybody's like, I'm glad they're having fun. <laughs> it's <laughs> like, kids get indoors. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. But in, instead of having fun, uh, we move on after that to uh, Cassandra Nova, not Cassandra Nova, um, uh, what was it? Lalandra wanting to murder Professor X because she thinks he's Cassandra Nova. Right. Uh, we get that bit, and then we also get 
Oh God, that the whole thing with uh, the introduction of Dust. Yes, a Dust, a character that Marvel then quickly forgot they had, um, but but not a. Pl- I mean, pretty unpleasant introduction to this character. Yeah, um, you know, again, age poorly. You know, maybe if you don't have that many, um, y- you know, Middle Eastern descent characters, they shouldn't have sand-based powers. That that was kind of uh, really fucking stupid. <laughs> it was <laughs> just a little bit, yeah. And I, I, and I'm, I normally, I'm like, I call people, I, I'm like, I roll my eyes, and people are like, oh my god, you, how, how, uh, you know, you're seeing things that aren't there. But maybe this was me. I saw it as very condescending to the people of India when you know they arrive after the the, the potential terrorist takeover on the uh, plane. Like yeah, Air India, and, yeah. Know, and the uh, they get there, and the ex court uh, was it uh, uh, Bombay or uh, sorry Mumbai, the Mumbai yeah. ex court, mm-hmm. and there you know here's Warpath. Uh, and the rest of the co- in their old school costumes and like oh they liked the, the kind of the flashy stuff and I'm like just like it just seemed very kind of condescending it's like the Bollywood con- it just seemed to me oh, oh yeah. a- absolutely and, and I mean you know also having like the hijackers name being Muhammad too was also just like <laughs> this is so awful like what are you doing it, it doesn't it, it you know it, especially after everything that happened very recently. You would think it's like, you know what? Not even going to go there. This is an X-Men book. But yeah. no, it was this like, be... we're going to go there, but in a way that's uh, stupid and doesn't help anything. This would be about a year and a half after 9-11, roughly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good call. That definitely Muhammad on the plane. Um, yeah, super, super good, super good time. No, it was great. And uh, this gets us to um, the lead up to the riot at Xavier's where we introduce uh, Quentin Choir. That's right. So Quentin Quire, a major character coming out, and also a lot of these characters in the last five, six years, they've they've really wanted to go back to, there's Glob or Globe or whatever the fuck. I was thinking thinking. Glob Herman. I was like Glob. I mean, sure. There's, yeah. Well, they all go back to them because everyone there now is in their you know mid-30s and they were in college when they read this. So that's just how these things go. <laughs> the best. Yeah, Tattoo will be showing up any moment now, or maybe yeah. already has. I don't know. Um, it's yeah. So so we get this introduction of Quentin Choir, uh, going to be a major major character for the X Men. We've got a new artist now on the book uh, for a couple issues, and we we introduce Kick. So Kick is going to be kind of the new thing that uh, that this comic is going to run with, and or or had it is this is the beginning of Kick, isn't it? This is I. Th- this is at least the beginning of when they're addressing it as kick and acknowledging that it's like a thing, because this is the death of the, um, the one, uh, Jungle Carnation. yeah, yeah. Joel Carnation, who, who's clearly also an over the top queer, sure. you know, character. And, um, the reveal with that character too, is it turns out, it wasn't the human's fault. He died because he was like a, a, a druggie. Right. He overdosed on kick. And it's like, wh- how did he overdose on kick? Because clearly a kick, you know, you got to take it. If they, if you'd seen a, like he goes to a corner and like, there's no scene setting this up to my knowledge. Yeah. And this idea that, okay, so what does he get more creative because he takes it? It's like, like they never really identified, like if he had taken it and then, got into a fight and then died because of the, you know, the overdose. Okay, fine. And the idea of kick, I don't mind the idea, but it's such a waste. Like this idea of like, okay, if so if mutancy is now not seen as such a terrible thing, people want to be mutants that maybe like what happens if a human takes it or what happens like these low grade. It's like in the X-Men cartoon, the X-Men animated series, when they'd have like the mutant that basically just looks like Hans Molman, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. like the giant like, the furry beard, looks like some out of like a, like a, uh, 60s comics underground comics character is like he takes kicks to make, make himself feel better because he's like his powers suck or something it's like jubilee takes it now she's shooting off you know rockets out of her hands or something like, yeah the, the the big problem here is, is the problem with the whole run where grant has a lot of ideas and doesn't take the time to develop them exactly and with kick 
the impression I got, which seems to be what the, the text is getting across, is kick will like increase your powers by fivefold or more. Right. But then Grant, while also doing this, decides I'm going to introduce a bunch of mutants that don't have any powers. They're just ugly. Right. So what use does kick have for all of these characters that Grant came up with? What, what, what good is kick going to do beak? Like he's five times more hollow bones. <laughs> we lay more eggs per day. <laughs> you know, it's just like, it's like you can't kick made more sense with like nineties X-Men kind of, shenanigans where all these mutants like really they focus on them having superpowers yeah it's like you either introduce mutants that have no powers and they're just uh, ugly and more like morlock kind of characters or you do kick doing both makes no sense no ex yeah no exactly i mean this whole you know so, so they basically form a little gang Choir gets himself a whip for some reason. It, 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 I, I can't tell that his power seemed to alter between this run and how everybody used him in the future, but okay, no problem. Yeah, no, he's a very inconsistent character. So they, they go out there, they tag some walls, They uh, he starts wearing the Magneto was right shirt because that's you know some, some good stuff. The, the but, but meanwhile, Zorn is out. And this is all going to lead up to the big reveal from Zorn. Zorn's out uh, with his special class. Which is, is it, they never say it, but this is the class of special needs dummies, basically. Yeah. Um, I shouldn't say it that way, but... It, no, it, it's um, <laughs> it's the class for, like, um, the, the mutants who aren't going to be in, like, the X-Men. Right. Or even New Mutants, or even the Hellions. They're yeah. not going to even be fodder. They wouldn't even allow them to be that. It's like, As opposed to the other class that has, like, Tattoo and some of these other characters who have no powers. But it's, it's all good. Quentin Quire, um, unfortunately, is one of the, if not the most interesting, like, villain in this whole run, yeah. Um, yeah, and, sure. uh, which, which is sad. But, um, <laughs> you know, it's the whole thing kind of feels like a bit of an allegory to the, um, like, the uh, Pink Panthers, um, you, you know, that um, yep. civilian uh, queer... Uh, like militia kind of group in the nineties where they all like had like a sort of similar uniform and, yep. uh, you know, would like bash back. Like that's kind of um, what Grant's going for here. And like, they almost do it. Um, it's weird. I, I feel like this is a story that could have used more time to develop and would have been more interesting, but they wasted so much time earlier on like, uh, Cassandra Nova and yeah, the Shi'ar Cassandra Nova stuff felt like forever. And it was it, it, because it was. I mean, you look at the book; you're you're two thirds of the way through it, and you're finally getting to choir, finally getting to kind of this concept of the school, which was another thing that Morrison said he wanted to do was kind of introduce the school again. This is really the first time it's felt like a school. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess other than Beak wanting to give a bat to. Uh, the beast and that bat makes a new appearance when uh, one of the characters here uses it to club Xavier over the head. So yeah, but but the other thing too is um, unfortunately this arc ends like uh, like an idiot wrote it because uh, was it Esme's the one who no it wasn't Esme the one of no, them no. sacrifices themselves. Oh no, um, uh, Sophie. Yeah, Sophie. Yeah, no, Sophie. So Sophie sacrifices herself to stop Quentin. Which uh, again makes no sense. Why? Why? Kick, he gets in Cerebra, has yeah. the four sisters, knocks. Uh, I, I will say one of uh, quite least a most great pieces of art ever. And the fact that he, I don't know how he came up with the, you know, you see the, you see the nervous system, you see the muscle system, the bone, like, you're being oh, yeah. knocked backwards. Some great art. I, I don't, it's oh, beautiful, but it's pointless. And then, like, oh, Sophie dies. And it's like, okay, what was her plan? She just, if she had like turned off his brain or something, I get it. Like if, if he was like fighting back, but it was like, it seems like there's like scenes missing from that. It just did not seem like, okay, if there was like some kind of mental struggle and then Quentin on kick and her on kick, even with her sisters and maybe with the whole reveal later with Esme, like maybe like, oh, you know, set, set her up or this, that would, there's something, there was something going on. It just did not seem like it didn't make no sense. What, yeah. what was going on that Jean Grey with Phoenix powers couldn't handle those? Yeah. 
Yeah, it, it it seems very odd. I mean, Wolverine's grown a, a cool little goatee, but um, but yeah, the the X Men themselves seem very very helpless in in all of this. Lot of yeah. Emma walking around with the, the the twins, just nobody's doing much. Yeah, but like, and it's like I don't understand Sophie's sacrifice, especially since they Quentin only apparently ended up being in a situation where two mutants possibly died, maybe only one. So it didn't seem to rise to the level of self-sacrifice to stop him. Right. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think they, they, they seem to have it more or less in hand. I mean, he was, he was throwing his whip around, but it really didn't feel like we had a major threat there. But, and, and it is worth noting that at this point, the protesters have shown back up again at the mansion. So that, no, that, that out of it. nowhere for no reason. If he was, if Quentin, Quentin was killing parents and protesters, and like maybe you know because of the somehow, uh, you know, like Gene's distracted, or maybe he even somehow somehow Gene's taken out of the picture. Okay, boom, there you go. That's like it raises a threat level, but that's not even done. It's this like what's it, it seems such a waste and so poorly done for someone that supposedly you know oh my god god among men grant morrison can do no wrong or he can do no right in this regard yeah i, I mean um we'll get more into it towards the end of this oh, but yeah. there's like more behind the scenes stuff that kind of i think explains why grant may have checked out uh, as well Clearly, yeah, about, about mid of, middle of the way through, I would say. <laughs> yeah, because, um, yeah, again, this makes no sense. Um, after uh, three of your students get killed, somehow the state of New York is like, you can keep operating as a school. That's fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, they're flaming by running down the street, all kinds of, it, it's all good. You're, you're, I, I, you're, I, I, st- I still like that, though. I am the inhuman torch. I, oh, I, it's I, funny. I, yeah, they're, I still oh, yeah, like yeah. that, but uh, yeah, it's. You know, the There's idea that no one would step in and do anything about that. There's no ramifications. There's like not even a panel of talking to the police, like sending them away or like whatever. Like, do a wolf. you know, like how are you going like, to race? Well, clearly they've already erased people's minds before. So maybe that's what they're doing. They're, they're villainous acts. It's like how, how much moral high ground do you have when you're like erasing like tapes? You're erasing people's memories of this. You're rewriting things. Like, oh, that didn't happen. Oh, there was no riot yeah. there. You know, then, like the- <laughs> yeah. Then we get like a total waste of an issue, which is just people standing around talking, and then eventually Scott almost sleeps with Emma, and that's a whole issue in his mind. Yeah, and and then it's a whole issue of what um you know Larry was was talking about before, where where Gene is basically just like, I'm going to make you relive all your trauma because I'm the hero. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, like it, it, it. This whole, I mean, all aspects of this, this weird betrayal. I mean, this this entire relationship is played super, super strange between Gene and and Cyclops. I mean, like our first issue, they talk about how they haven't slept together in like five months, and it's. Cl- I mean, clearly there's problems here, and and yet then they go here, and then this reveal, this this psychic kind of walk through Emma's mind, which I think is supposed to. Like I said, I it's it's unclear what. It's trying to accomplish at this point, but it, it seems ends- humiliating. It, it to me it says like degrading, humiliating, humiliating to Emma, and the kind of the reveal like oh she just came back for like and then it's the you know. Let me get our murder mystery is what we get. Oh yeah, the the the, sh- the, the gunshot heard around the world. Who shot Emma? You know, it's the yeah, oh, it's all over again. And it's like, it's so stupid. Um, but um, we we get some good Phil Jimenez art. That's something. Yes. But, but, um, is great I, here, yeah. I, there's a lot of good detail. I, I I'm shocked by by Grant Morrison's restraint to not call this arc Emma's for murder. Oh. <laughs> wow! That I'm surprised. We, we got already got E for E is for extinction. So yeah. M for murder. That would have been. I mean, we we got murder at the mansion. So yeah, and then who done it? Now it has a, like a little on the nose. Uh, there, along with that that cover of Bishop as the, the Terminator, I or, I always saw it with the red. I always thought it was like the Cobra poster because both are the same, the, the Terminator yeah. and Cobra, Cobra Cop and Terminator. But it, it just it made me think of like your disease, none the cure. <laughs> it, it introduces this concept that Sage and Bishop act as CSI, and you know he's he's a mutant detective. Associate's name is Sage, and the the mansion's on lockdown and. You get this shot of all the mutants like, whoa, whoa, you know, and 
they're going to investigate the bullet and, and go all through this. Um, we get more, we, we, we do get the reveal that uh, Beak and, and uh, Angel are, have had some babies. So that, that, that makes them more endearing for sure. Yeah. Um, but w we also are, are never properly explained how just putting all the diamond pieces back together of Emma brings her back to life. I, I got that from, <laughs> I, no, that makes no sense. But the, you know, oh, Jean, so Gene fuses her together. It's Deus Ex Phoenix powers, you know, this idea of putting her back together. And I'm like, but she's dead. It, it's this, this isn't. You know, like she died. She's she's clearly in pieces. This isn't okay. Iceman, I can maybe see it with Iceman. I can maybe see it, and even then, that'd be a stretch. But diamonds, no. I'm sorry, but you know, I'm glad that uh, Emma did that. Uh, you know, that Gene resurrected Emma instead of uh, the two students who got murdered earlier. Or, yeah. um, <laughs> you, you know, uh, any of the people who died in in Genosha. Or, uh, you know, or Sophie. <laughs> yeah, well, screw those people. Um, no, I, I mean, she, she glues Emma back together. Um, and, and then we get the reveal that it was Esme. Yeah. Who is, uh, you know, she, she, she was the one who shot Emma. And she's up to shenanigans. We don't know exactly what. And now Scott Summers is missing because these two are the best detectives. Uh, they've they've lost one of the main culprits in this entire thing, but no problem. And where has he gone? What do you do when you're caught by your wife uh, sleeping with a telepath? You go to a strip joint and look at a girl who's dressed up like your old wife. While drinking some delicious Jack Denails. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather have been made up. Like, why couldn't it have been like something else? Like, that was so terrible. And it's, it, I, I understand. Like, don't want to. We don't want to give Jack Daniels any average free advertising. You know? It, it like, is hilarious. Um, oh, before before uh, we get too far into this, did you all notice the? The taxi cab that picks up Esme has no driver and just drives off on its own. Which is the clue. That yeah. is the big clue of what's coming. But and yeah, that's a stupid clue, though. It's like, I look at it, it's like, okay, so was he like 500 feet down the road and then she stops and she's got to get around and drive herself? Because was Magneto dry? So Magneto now can, he can shift well, gears, steer steering wheels, that, to, like, this is, it was so stupid. Like, he, if that's the clue. Good. I mean, he can make a black hole out of his head. So honestly, driving the car down a couple miles down the road is no problem. Like that is not a, that is not an issue. I I still <laughs> I hate it. I hated it so much. It's like because I was like I was I was reading. I was like I actually had to stop. Like is is that supposed to be the clue? Is that supposed to be like oh, oh sure, the hint, yeah, that was, oh that it's, hint, cool. it's really Magneto the whole time. I'm like no, it was really me, the Invisible Man, <laughs> the Invisible Man. The, uh, mutant or something the, that was so stupid like that was yeah oh god if she had yeah. floated away if she got up in like a, some kind of box and just flew into the sky I'm like okay metal box okay i get that a car uh, I, it uh, I, I don't know i just what hey, might have been cooler is if like you know it was like toad or something like that showed up so that way it's like that a toad or the, yeah. the guy with the crab claw hands and feet yeah. but, but yeah the hellfire strip club yeah, Cyclops drowning, and I, I used to like Bacalo's art, but Bacalo here, oh, God. this is like when I kind of turn my my taste and like Generation X yeah. with with Mark Buckingham inking him, or even um, Dan Panosian and X Men yeah. Unlimited when he do work on there. Mm -hmm. Great, Townsend, I like Townsend. Don't get me wrong, he's a nice guy. I think I met him two times uh, at conventions, but. The art here was terrible. It was, oh, I, it was so hard to read. Everything it just looked ugh, lumpy. Like everybody's made of mashed potatoes. It's, <laughs> it's very stylized. It like, is. It's 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 still competent. It's just very stylized in a way that um, really, especially stands out in in this book because you just go to such a drastically different art style. You're like, am, am I reading the same series? Like. <laughs> At least Corday had the he had the this QC. He was also doing uh, was it Soldier X at the time, Cable slash Soldier X, mm -hmm. and he was putting that work in a week. I think it was like Van Skyver was behind, Quietly yeah. was behind. So he's doing twenty two pages in a week and inking it too. 
because I guess they couldn't get the pages to somebody to ink that quickly. So he was doing, and it was like, oh, it's trash. And I'm like, you know what? I applaud that guy. And actually, I still like I prefer his art over the over uh, of uh, Bacalos and even Van Skyvers for that matter, because there's actually some character to it. There's some life and like there, it feels. The, there's something beautiful behind this. No, yeah, there could be potential, but sure. Uh, no, but, no. You're, you're, hey, it's, granted, this is you know personal taste and like everything's art subjective. No, I, but. I understand what you're saying. Uh, I, I hate how Bacalo right, draws uh, Wolverine in this issue in particular. Uh, <laughs> he, looks like he looks he like a foot. He looks like a walking foot. <laughs> he, he changes a lot from panel to panel. I think that's one of the problems. Is uh, you, you're kind of wondering if if this comic because it's all set at the Hellfire Strip Club club. And they're getting, you know, Scott's getting progressively drunk, and his face seems to morph and alter through the comic. So you're kind of wondering, yeah. oh, okay, this is this is some genius level drawing here. They're they're actually making him shift uh, the more he drinks. So yeah, and um, you know, again, before we we keep going, uh, you, you know, we did gloss over because um, there's just so much filler um, that that we. I, I forgot how much filler there was, but oh yeah, the whole arc of. Um, Beast pretending to be gay has has now happened. We 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 finished that the uh, role model thing. Yeah, I want to be a role model to people. And, yeah. Well, yeah, it's um it's done horribly. Um, he he defends it by being like, I might as well be gay. I'm oppressed, <laughs> and it's like <laughs> no, just yikes. I mean, yeah, some of the dialogue during the riot. You're right. There there's parts in this that are just. Like uh, it, it is, it is painful, and you don't know, you don't know how this got past an editor. I mean, some of the stuff with Emma and Angel, and and definitely the stuff with Beast. There, there is some, there is some painful crap in here. Yeah, a, a lot of this seems like they took a very hands off approach with Grant to the book's detriment. Yes, um, they really needed to uh, be on top of Grant and. Uh, but instead, they they let Grant uh, steer a ship in a direction they didn't want, just so they could retcon almost everything after anyway. Which is exactly what I mean. Not to jump ahead because we still got a couple more arcs here, but they they did. It was remarkable how quick they undid everything. I mean, oh, yeah. the stuff, the all of it. I mean, I mean, Gene at least was a, a few years later, but. Uh, we do get a, a nice dick joke from uh, Sabretooth the Wolverine. So that- yeah, no, they're standing next to each other in a urinal because because that's cool. But um, but even the Gene stuff, I think um, it's only like a year or two after this that you get Phoenix End Song. That's right. That's right. It was yeah. That's right. They they and they redid things with uh, the, the, the 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 Cuckoo Twins or not twins, but that the, the three because spoiler another one dies, but. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But um, but yeah, we we get uh, this whole stupid weapon plus arc with you men and all of the stuff we were talking about before, where like it turns out that Captain America was the first weapon, and uh, yeah, I think you even said there was a weapon zero. I think there was like a weapon before Captain America, and like you never reveal what that's supposed to be. He was which, part of the Avengers BC. That's uh, that's uh, God. <laughs> don't don't joke about that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you get this idea of the world, and it, it's another case where you kind of wonder, like you said, they needed an editor or somebody to come in here, because you, you you bring up the world. There's a lot of writers who are very entranced by this. They've come back to it a few times now. And in X-Men comics. was his uh, Uncanny X-Force yeah. one. Yeah, there's, there's been things they've done, and it's, it's an interesting concept, but it's not fleshed out. And you don't get the sense of, I, I mean, just a lot of ideas are being thrown off the page, and it just kind of skips us through. It, it's trying to decide whether it's wanting to do a history lesson or it's wanting to, I mean, it's just very unclear what, what the plan here is. Um, but this, this leads to kind of a, the big, you know, a bunch of big things. So Wolverine with his crazy eyes blows up this space station um, for reasons that are unclear because it doesn't really seem to do anything. Yeah, it, it matters almost as much as uh, Dark Star dying earlier in this run. That's such a blip; no one gives a fuck. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we we blazed right through that. Oh yeah, the whole X Core Paris, where there's every every character has like there's no character to him. Like Cannonball is not Cannonball. Siren isn't Siren. You know, yep. it's just terrible. Absolutely, multiple. None of them are 
who we've ever read them as. It's like because yep. Grant never read the stories. Grant never you know, actually got invested to who these characters are. He just wrote like, oh, uh, multiple man. Okay, I'll just write whatever. You know, he just he doesn't care. Yeah, and um, yeah, we have a there. There was such a brief funeral for for Dark Star earlier, and um, before they even get into the funeral, they immediately skip to something else and never go back. <laughs> Yeah, you know, <laughs> death matters until it doesn't. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's it's uh, we we basically so that sets up our end game. So the, the Wolverine's on a space station. It's been blown up, but it's still okay. I, I'm not sure how space works here. Cyclops is down in the ocean. Jean's going up to the space station. We flip back to the class where Zorn is now, you know, basically kind of convincing Dust. Uh, to do something, or try to convince her to do something. She goes crazy, attacks Charles, it's bad news, and uh, and and this this ultimately leads to the, the biggest reveal of all, which is, you know, the, the there's a map of the planet, or a map of the Earth that is flipped upside down, and Magneto is right, posters on here. Professor X is like, hey, I probably should have done some background checks before letting you teach a bunch of kids. Uh, but too late, because he's re-crippled, and now he takes off the mask and it's Magneto. Which the whole reversing the poles, that was the idea. That was, they already did that. They well tried to do that. That was, sure. that was one of the whole plot. yeah. Yeah. That was, yeah, that was actually one done like less than a year before new X-Men started. That was uh, when Brandon Peterson was doing the artwork. I remember I didn't pick the issues up. It didn't look that good. <laughs> actually. And it was like the whole, you know, building towards like, Oh, Magneto is going to flip the poles and, uh, I believe that's where kind of Joseph. I think Joseph sacrifices himself for that to stop that. I believe uh, it, something like that. I it was. Yeah. It's kind of when I started. It was basically when I was checked out of X Men. A lot of point. people were, but um, it, you know, the other thing too is it's good to know that uh, Magneto's also just, I guess, immune to that Sentinel virus or whatever. It's fine. And uh, that Sentinel virus, we all kind of got over it. No one cares anymore. Um, I, I don't think they ever like officially cured it. Like. I don't know why students weren't dying from it. No, no. They just felt better the next issue. People just, just felt a little better. Also, here's here's another big, ginormous, you know, I don't know if plot hole's the right word, but it's just like, so Magneto's been here for months. And not once did he attempt to kill Cassandra Nova imprisoned in the basement. Sure. The person yep. who murdered 16 million mutants, the whole impetus <laughs> for him wanting revenge on the world is in the basement of the Xavier Mansion, and not once does he even think to murder her. <laughs> I actually have that note written down. It's like Magneto rails on about the 16 million mutants that died, but where was he when that when he couldn't protect any of them from that metal monster? The fact that okay, so where well, was where was Magneto? Was he in that chair wheelchair or not? This none of this is explained. I, this I, isn't I some fancy it. like oh wow you got to take your own interpretation of it. So so was he busy in China building the pri the Zorn prison at this time? It's like, well, 16 million died. Okay, who cares? The fact that he wouldn't be angry about that, the fact that he wouldn't kill Cassandra Nova, that he wouldn't, it, you, Charles, you and your X-Men, you know, have, you failed, you failed the mutant race. You let millions of us die, tens of millions. And you've, you've, your, your, your dream it's becoming like it's become an albatross around your neck. You've dragged us down. You, you know, it's that care like oh, mutants and humans working hand to hand while we're being slaughtered by your twin. <laughs> but you know, like, it, none of it's covered. None of that's covered. No, and and also it's like how how come there's not even a debate within the school? Why isn't Emma talking about killing Cassandra Nova? Why isn't X Force just showing up at the mansion being like we're killing her? Yes, like, exactly. <laughs> you know, why isn't like Domino showing up? Like, like, I don't get it. There's so many characters who should be showing up at that mansion being like, no, we're killing her. That's it. She's <laughs> random with his giant gun hand. I'm going to shoot her. <laughs> any, any of them. I, and she's, she's basically in the basement in a big metal box. Like, it would be pretty trivial if he spent, I don't know, two years more. I mean, he created a secret Chinese prison for himself. He's been hanging out there. He's do, done all these things. 
And I mean, he could sit in the classroom and just, I mean, we already saw he could drive the taxi down the road a mile away or whatever. He, he could just kind of think his way down into the basement, crunch up that little uh, metal coffin like a can and be done with it. Yeah, he, in the sun or whatever. Lots of it's, options here. Lots, lots of options. Well, and not only that, but Zorn, well, Magneto as Zorn with a Chinese general, Chinese general providing mutants to the U Men, thus sublime, and all that. So Magneto was sacrificed, killing mutants in the Chinese prison willingly, sacrificing mutants to be parted out like some, like as some, you know, car lot, you know, one of those used parts lots. Where you pick and pull, where you take mute, your mutant powers, mutants' eyes, lungs, heart, whatever. Sure. Okay with this, just so he could get back at Xavier. Oh, sixteen million died. I don't care. I'm gonna get Xavier. I'm gonna sneak in. It was me all along. You know, it was me. It was like the Vince McMahon reveal. It was and, and so Vince, stupid. It doesn't really. I mean, like, so he goes to New York and proceeds to just fuck up Manhattan real good. Yeah, after all of the tone deaf, uh, you, you know, September 11th stuff earlier, they're like, you know what we should do? Destroy Manhattan. Yeah. <laughs> and build a giant incinerator because we're going to, you know, a, a crematorium because we're going to start executing humans. Uh, you, you have a double page spread here of him floating down the road with buildings toppling over and cars shooting into the sky and like police officers and firefighters, just, just stuff blown up everywhere. Um, good stuff. Uh, yeah. Also, why wouldn't the U.S. government or any representative of Gen Genosha be demanding to extradite uh, Cassandra Nova to face sure. crimes against humanity? Why isn't the, you, you know, like uh, the, the, UN. The, yeah, the, the U.N., the Avengers, right at the door saying, hey, we're going to take uh, this, this, you know, worse than, <laughs> you know, worse than Hitler about as bad as Stalin. We're going to take this person off your hands. We don't care that it's a mutant. We don't care if it's your sister. It's coming with us, whether you like it or not. The fucking Avengers are like, you can keep, you know, genocidal maniacs that killed keep 16 Hitler in your million, basement. <laughs> that killed 16 million people, but you better give us hope. Yeah. It's okay to keep Hitler in your basement, but don't uh, don't give us your. But we're gonna take your child. You gotta take, we gotta we gotta have the redheaded girl. That's that's how that's how it works when you're yeah, the. That's how the <laughs> he 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 thoroughly. I mean, you get pages and pages. He's got his new gang here. Um, Esme's uh, you know changed into a nice fancy top. That's cool. Um, it's a very it's a very sparkly top. Yeah. Um, and then he proceeds to go out and just rip up. Bridges and every, I mean, they, they, they continue to go over and over and over. They're murdering uh, people. Beak has, for, for whatever reason, decided this is a good place to bring his kid and, and just hang out on the, on the shoulder while, you know, Magneto is shooting up. But you get, you get a lot going on. And how many times has uh, Xavier been trapped in a tube at this point in this run? He's, he's getting really comfortable with, with being surrounded by goo with pipes in his nose. <laughs> Yeah. This is like the third fucking time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got to the uh, issue 150, and I wrote this down. Uh, Magneto wears Zorn's helmet. It says, my helmet is thought-proof. But it's not. Multiple times, <laughs> we've seen that you clearly can read Zorn's thoughts. And that's never explained. Go Even going back to the annual, that's never explained. Like You can read his mind. and Because even the, the Shi'ar um, telepath, the, like the assist uh, basically the head she telepath of the Shi'ar for Cassand uh for uh Lilandra reads the reads Zorn's mind as well as um Cyclops while they're being held upside down on the Shi'ar uh, you know, carrier. And none of this is probably like, oh I uh, had fake memory implant just a line, just anything. None of it's like like you said, completely checked out at this point. This is just well we need a, a surprise. Oh Magneto's back. And that's what it just feels like. It's just out, it, like it was pulled out of his ass. Like there's no, like, and then Magneto like, basically worried about his Q ratio. You know, uh, was it uh, 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 what do we call it? Um, is the I would call it the Q. Oh man, where your your popularity numbers? Yeah, whatever. your Q rating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Q rating. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, where he's like, but well, boss, nobody can see you up here. And like the worst Brotherhood of Evil Mutants you've ever seen. Most pathetic. They're like they're they're well. You know. <laughs> I mean, the whole bit, it's it's meant to be commentary on kind of uh, designer drugs and and kick and and being you know reading, leading revolutionaries, but he's still old, and that's kind of the whole 
joke they go but they, they like do a little concert in the park like on a tiny little stage and people like like what what the what the fuck's going on here um <laughs> I, it's just very very strange and then of course gene and wolverine are trapped on the space station for reasons well, the asteroid M trapped like we should have known it was him all along. Asteroid M and it's being flung at the sun. I'm um, not even buying this that that she can reassemble Emma with her mind, but she can't like take a piece of this space station and kind of move it on back. You know, like it's it's really it's impossible for you to move. You're you're able to completely reassemble and re bring somebody back to life with your brain, and but this is too hard. So but, but she's also trying to save a person who has uh, mutant healing factor. So yeah. come on. Yeah, so he uh, they decide the the way to do it is um, is is she's she's hurting she's dying Wolverine's gonna pop her in the chest which is not a great I mean great way to kill her like you, I, I don't know you're just kind of attacking the liver there I'm doing this right now with some whiskey and they get oh. out <laughs> they get out onto the the, the the basically the space station it shows the fire kind of consuming them and it fades to white. And that's that's it. And so, you know, certainly because we respect death, Wolverine and Jean Grey are dead at this point. Um, and that takes us to oh, God, almost the end. So, yeah, this it's weird how this last arc actually just keeps going. <laughs> in yeah, yeah, I it, end. It, it, it just it seems like it goes on way too long, and yeah, I'm like, please yeah. stop. <laughs> yeah, all of this run goes on way too long. Like honestly, it I I could, I forgot. How much of this drags with nothing actually like happening? I mean, they 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 kind of they, you know Cyclops is off rallying the troops. Um, we we get a brief analogy of Nazis. You know, Magneto doesn't like that word, so okay, that's that's good. Um, and it, again, it's these, these sad little park rallies. We've got giant smokestacks going on in New York. I mean, there's it's it's there's some very nice artwork here, but there's some weird stuff going on in New York. Yeah, I, I mean, Philomena's um, is is solid here, but but again, it's like it's just to the service of what? Yeah, exactly. Like, and then Professor X with the weird spider walking chair thing later. Yeah, I, I mean, this, it, we we do get the reveal. Hey, Gene's not dead. Uh, Wolverine's healing himself up. Eyes growing back. We're gonna turn back, and we're gonna, now we're gonna get some big action. In comes Phantom X. We're getting. We're getting some major awesome stuff, but but half of the battle is them kind of punking Magneto that he's he's old and washed up and therefore not a good revolutionary. Yeah, like that's that's like half the battle. And then, damn it, if Beak doesn't bring that bat back, like that 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 <laughs> titanium bat makes a third appearance in this comic again for the service of nothing, though. <laughs> again, yeah, it's immediately taken away. Um, and then Cyclops, I've always been confused by this. Uh, Cyclops kind of has him on the ropes and he, he basically right into his eyes and face blasts him with his, his ruby beams there and blows up the helmet. It's strong enough to blow up the helmet, but apparently not Magneto or his eyes or yep. half his hair. Like how, how did he survive that? That was death. He's got a full mouth of teeth too. Yeah. <laughs> I really don't understand. Like he's he's two inches away. He shows Magneto's eyes opening and the helmet completely blowing off. But then he's he's pretty much okay. He just yeah. looks old and crappy, as they as they say. You're a fossil. This you is know, a, kick yeah. is a hell of a drug. You know, <laughs> <laughs> just so there's kind of the the uh, you know the Esme dies. You know, uh, bad news there, and uh, they definitely have Magneto on the ropes. But it, it, he gets one last little attack. He he gives a lethal electromagnetic pulse to have a, to give Gene a stroke. I guess. Which, uh, also stupid. Why? If you're going to pick one of these mutants to do that with, don't pick it to the one who's come back from the dead multiple times and also in the last issue. Yes, I, and is is clearly displaying full Phoenix power at this point. Different. I mean, this is somebody who kills planets, but you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna give it a stroke. All right. The, the, the idea that Phoenix can go through cosmic rays, gamma rays, coronas of suns, like fly into suns, all this that magneto uh, stroke, electromagnetic stroke. This 
a suspension of disbelief. I, I, I couldn't. It was just so maybe, very stupid. Maybe if we didn't literally just watch Gene get murdered with animantium claws <laughs> one issue earlier. Yeah. Yeah, but but yeah, there's this the, he, yeah, and then Wolverine chops off uh, Magneto's head, so that's that's good, and uh, we're all done. So we've killed off Magneto, we've killed off Gene, Death matters, uh, and we get to our final arc, which is set 150 years in the future. Because what we really needed to catch up on was the character that we've been building to this entire series, the one that that really was the highlight of this, and that was Sublime. Well, also, I, I got to say, what a waste of bringing Silvestri back. Absolutely. This is what you bring back a, a legend to this book, and you're like, this is the arc you give him? Yeah. <laughs> Just to get another retread of Days of Future Past that isn't nowhere near as good or memorable or creative. And though I, will say, I, I will say this. Clearly, uh, I, I, I reread this, and I'm like, oh, my God. Wow, Hickman really did borrow from Grant. Not the good, not the good. Oh, he absolutely did. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I was like, wow, this is not good. (laughs) No, and like, um, and again, uh, part of the reason this exists is because it was available in trade at the time when Grant was doing the minimal research they did for this. (laughs) Yeah. Essential X Men Volume Two, which has that included. Yeah. You know, you know. Burn and Claremont did in two issues, but Grant had to do in four or five. Um, yeah, it, was like, it was, I guess, four, but also um, it's so stupid. And it's like, why is Cassandra Nova back? And everyone's like, like I don't care if 150 years go by. She murdered oh, 16 million people. <laughs> yes. And she's like not an actual person. She's like a motion incarnate. A f- former amoeba. A former basically, okay, uh, Consciousness in a fetus Proto, cell, Proto Proto goo, I think, yeah, and then you know, an, an alien morph, morphogenic body, which is that is the current state when we're introduced 150 years in the future, along mm-hmm. with the three remaining cuckoos who may or may not be they don't age androids. Apparently. Yeah, they're. I, I, I was like, are they androids? Are they clones? Who knows? It's it, it was it, such a waste. Like I said, waste of Sylvester. And honestly, if you're going to do a Days of Future Past style story, you know, maybe the threat never, like, oh, I got the Phoenix egg for what? I, it will cleanse the earth. I'm like, oh, uh, the Phoenix doesn't work that way. <laughs> it usually takes the entire solar system. It's not I just going to do one thing. It's 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 peculiar. We get the beast has been taken over by Sublime. We get a couple new characters here. Yes, we get Cassandra Nova. Uh, it, I mean, just just again, odd odd type. I mean, yeah. I mean, I guess we're supposed to wonder how did we get here? What amazing things happened in the last 150 years? I hope they, I definitely hope they go back and they they come in and they they you know address all this at some point. But um, it's it's a bookmarked or a bookended uh, four part story that basically gives us Scott saying, kind of admitting, you know what, I've I've checked out my wife's grave and I'm. You're wearing that top I like and the fur coat. I'm well, I'm going with you, and this is this is the end of Morrison. Yeah, and, and like um, also with Sublime, we never resolve that, and and we also don't even really resolve it here. No. <laughs> it's like the whole idea yeah. that the future diverged because of Cyclops saying, "You know what? I'm I'm tired of this. I quit." <laughs> you know, like I feel like the reader. I'm already tired of this. I quit. No, no, you quit. The, the future's terrible. No, but this is terrible. <laughs> but this is this is revolutionary. Cyclops has never quit the X Men before. Exactly. Right. Yeah. It, <laughs> it, it, it's the first time he's always been the Rock, the Rock of the X Men. He's never left it ever. Yeah. He's yeah. never he's never quit. Certainly not over a woman. <laughs> <laughs> so he's Man, also he, he's he's certainly never quit the X Men for the exact same fucking reason he quit the X Men this time. <laughs> It's My God. literally the same reason. It was so point like the, the pointless nature and, and listeners. Uh, hopefully, we're getting this across. The point, like, why retread something that you've the original is already there? If the if, if original, okay, somehow 
all the copies of the classic Claremont burn run, even going back to the Cockrum stuff, all that's gone. Like somehow it's been removed from every computer or every copy has been absconded in the night. It's gone. Okay, I understand maybe taking, you know, plays off of that. But when you can read the original stuff and it's actually good and it still holds up, and why do this? Now, granted, this is 20 years ago. This is basically 20 years after Claremont and Byrne did this. Grant did this. 20 years, <laughs> you know, we're 20 years past that. Yeah. There's no reason for it. There is absolutely no reason that this story had to happen and these beats and this ideas of, oh, it happened before, it happened again, all oh, cyclical natures and all this and that. No, it's retreaded garbage. <laughs> I, I, love, yeah. I love bits of it. And I, reading this, I was, I was really excited. I was like, I love four times. It's, mm-hmm. honestly, it's, I, I, I still love my omnibus. I'm not going to get rid of it. Of course. Yeah. Mem- good memories attached. Mm-hmm. But it's garbage. This is absolute <laughs> garbage. The it's like yeah, in garbage you can find you know a working toaster oven or oh somebody lo- lost a Rolex in the garbage, but it's still garbage. You've gone uh, harder on this, yeah, yeah, did. Uh, I, feel, I, I feel bad because I, I remember the I excitement just, of oh my god, Beast looks like a beast and it's like kind of mm-hmm. monstrous form, yeah. and then the yeah. Beast isn't Beast. This isn't the jovial my, like when he, the one time he does the My Stars and Garters, Grant's got to go all Bendis with dropping an F bomb, just like you know, sweet F and Christmas, sweet fucking Christmas. There you go, or oh my stars and fucking garters, oh ha ha. Like this is it was so <laughs> terrible. It's such a disrespect to the characters, and not even for a good reason. You got some kick in you. That's what happened, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, but it's um. It, Part of the frustration here, uh, too, is, is going back to when we were talking about the manifesto. It goes against everything the manifesto said they, and they wanted to do. The they still yeah. fucking greenlit it. And I get, the, I get the point where you have these people, you, you, you come in and it's like the idea of like a horror movie or any movie, like you put a lot of extra gore in, you put a lot of this and that, because they're going to ask you to cut stuff. It's like, we're going to cut her head off and put it on a spike, and then we're going to take her, you know, oh, she, she was pregnant with a baby, we're going to drop kick the baby and do an f- open fire, and it's going to be kicking and screaming, and they're, they're going to cut movie you're watching. Well, well, I'm yeah. just saying these examples, so they cut that back to just to just the decapitation and, I, and allow that to be to get through the sensors and all that. I just, I want to remind This is like the like, Grant run rough shot, like I'm doing I, right I, now. I just remind everybody that <laughs> Grant wrote, um, you know, the stage is never cleared for new car- new creations to develop and grow. The comic has turned inwards and has gone septic like a toenail. The only people reading are fanboys who don't count. Um, to make the X-Men feel fresh once more, we need to take a closer, harsher look at what's not working in this book and comics field in general. The recent X-Men stuff has been written in an old-fashioned, over style for one. And we need to update, streamline, demystify the storytelling techniques to considerably appeal to modern sensibilities. Um <laughs> but this doesn't. This is extremely dense. You come into it not knowing what's going on, who is who, what's what. These characters, okay, who's White Queen? I've never read, well, oh, this cold fish. She's a teaching. Okay, so she survives. Clearly, that's a surprise to everybody else. Oh, Xavier's willing to blow his brains out. Oh, Xavier, you know, uh, tried to kill, he killed his sister in the womb. We didn't know he had a sister. Well, uh, sister somehow wants to, you know, kill all mutants because reasons, because it has nothing, you know, to do with her plan to take his body, then go to the Shi'ar just so they can come back and wipe out all mutants, cause havoc in the Shi'ar homeworlds. Um, the throne world and everything, and then come back and do all that. Oh, and turns out Magneto was uh, uh, who doesn't clearly cares for the future state of all mutants. Allowed sixteen million of them to die, and then said, "I'm gonna you know continue all my plan to hide out in a Chinese prison until the X Men come to me, and then free me, and then I'm gonna stay with monks until Cyclops comes to me again, so I can go to the school because it, reasons." It, <sighs> it, it, it's it's a painful it's a painful thread, and it is. Um, so I mean, it, it, Joe, as, as you were pointing out, like like behind the scenes, Morrison. Well, I mean, take a step back. So Morrison leaves yeah. DC under a bit of a cloud in the sense of like, there were some comments that maybe he felt like the Matrix ripped off the Invisibles. And- yeah, there, there were a few things there, um, but but just to jump in real quick to follow up what you were saying with with Grant's rant, I think it's also important to include this line from the manifesto. Uh, you know, following up what you said about how they hate fanboys and forget about fanboys and we need to update stuff because of how poorly it's been written for the past like couple of decades. Grant yeah. also says in the manifesto, this same document, 
continuity is stripped right back because like most of the new readers we want to attract, I haven't read the last 20 years of X titles and I ain't about to neither. <laughs> that is verbatim. Grant yeah. both says they don't like how the book's written, followed almost immediately by saying, I didn't read it. This yeah. is exactly the Dave Chappelle, Rick James couch bit. It is. In a comic. It, it absolutely is. It is. Uh, it's, a, it's spot on. That's exactly what this is. And it, it's so strange coming from kind of uh, some, some bit of fallout at DC, some, some issues he was having. He comes to Marvel. Marvel's very happy. It's a big get. He proceeds to write what seems like a dare me not to do this project pitch. Yeah. And they, they go give it to him and they go all in and... Mm -hmm. And and some of these, I mean, you know, quietly, I think Van Skyver at the time, Jimenez, I think these are these are not cheap artists at the time. Like they're 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 putting some cash into this book. Oh yeah, no, I, I mean, quietly alone, and, and uh, with the idea that seemed at the time, oh, we'll get quietly to do this whole run, maybe some fill-ins. Like that's the impression you got. Oh yeah, that was definitely how it was billed to people. I mean, back low, I mean, almost all the artists on here were were you know bigger money artists. Yeah. And they, but they, yeah, and, and, and definitely it felt like a bait and switch to, about quietly for, to me, but including yeah. when they kept using him for the covers and he wasn't the interior art, which Marvel wasn't doing as much of back then. That's, that's definitely standard practice now, but. Yeah, but, but you, you had some turmoil behind the scenes. You had uh, Mark Powers, who was the one who originally greenlit this. You get Mark Powers sh departs shortly after this starts and, and Mike Martz takes over. So Mike Martz wasn't the original person who who greenlit this, but um, but Grant does work with Mike later because he's the editor for at least part of his Batman run. So so they don't have a full falling out or anything like that over this. Oh. Mike, Mark Powers leaves and Mike Martz takes over the book. Um, so you have that turbulence going on. Um, Bill Jemis departs as president uh, during this run. Um, Grant, uh, I, I hinted at it earlier with um, bringing some pitches to back to DC. Uh, Grant was getting frustrated because they had all these other ideas and Marvel wasn't interested in them. They 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 were enamored at the idea of getting Grant without actually wanting Grant. It seemed like so. So then DC starts courting Grant back, and it's at San Diego Comic Con 2003, well before this runs over where Grant announces at the Vertigo panel minutes after letting Casada know he's leaving Marvel, that he's signing this exclusive again with, you know, with DC. Yeah. Which, which might explain, although it still is a lot of Dick comments. Um, you have Casada kind of going all out about, uh, you know, more, there's these interviews that Casada is doing and these statements from Marvel that you know and, and and really in particular around you know the the creative team that would follow joss whedon following the title uh or you know the people are asking casada uh, you're going to explain this better than i but basically people are asking casada hey uh you know there's a rumor joss whedon's going to come on the title and and casada is like nah nah that's that's gotta, gotta burst your bubble no way yeah no uh casada is very uh boisterous about this to say the least um him and grant apparently got into a screaming match on uh, the floor of, of San Diego that apparently some people witnessed uh, beforehand, which I imagine was like uh, Noah Cross yelling in front of the Albacore Club in Chinatown. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but um, so you have that going on. And he, he says he got the new writer uh, for New X-Men within two hours of that, which, um, no. He, uh, he, Chuck Austin took over, uh, after Grant briefly, um, which is probably what he was alluding to and not the fact that they were starting this new book, Astonishing with Joss and, yeah. and John Cassidy, it leaked that they were coming on to do X-Men and he did that whole, like what a politician does of like, oh, I know what you're asking me, but I'm not going to answer it. I'm going to answer a different question kind of thing. Well, he does, but he actually, he goes far. Like he says point blank, uh, there's the, I know there, it, that would be wonderful. It happened, but there's no 
That is not happening. It is a yeah. complete rumor. That is definitely not happening. 20 days, I, I looked up, less than 20 days later, they announced. Days. Uh, it, was 20, it was on the 21st. It was like right. 7th right. was when the article yeah. went out, and then 21st. Right. Uh, 14, yeah. days later, 14 days later, they announced that uh, Joss Whedon is on the book. Or on Astonishing. Yeah. And no, it, it's it's so <laughs> stupid. And then, um, uh, according to Comics Beat, um, with with Heidi McDonald, um, mentions that um, it was uh, Bill uh, who drove Grant away, uh, which which makes sense. Uh, I think it's fair to say, no matter if you like Grant or you like Bill or you like both, that they are very different people. Oh yeah, yeah. and um, it makes sense that they did bud heads and um heidi saying something like that she was i think still an editor at dc around this time so it would make sense that she was kind of in the know on uh what was going on there um so so yeah so all this is happening uh i think grant's relationship with marvel soured really quickly yeah and that's i think part of what hurts uh, new new X Men is, is this like strained relationship. I'm sure he was also frustrated with the uh, constant change in artists and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, quietly got uh, somewhat of a bad reputation, I'd say, through this because it, it, like you alluded to earlier, they they expected that he would be doing the majority of this, but he got a lot of delays um, that were that seemed unexpected. I don't know if we've ever gotten real answers to why. Yeah, I, I'm not sure we we ever really did either, but um, he he was very delayed. And so, y you know, I I think he, all of these factors sort of hurt. I, I think um, not planning far enough out in advance, and that's not Grant's fault. That's Marvel's fault. It's like okay. Marvel was bringing on Grant for long term and was fine with Grant planning out, you know, just a year ahead. Which, um, when you're doing monthly comics and you're doing that grind, that you lose that time really fast. Oh yeah, yeah. It it is. I, I don't. This seems like a recipe. So in in general, it's it's a book, and and we've we've pointed out definitely a lot of the flaws here tonight uh, with everything that went on here. Whenever this show goes up, shouldn't say things like tonight. Rookie mistake. <laughs> um, <laughs> But it's 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 got it's 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 packed with a lot of ideas, very little follow through on most of those ideas, and a lot of just jumping around that seem to erode kind of the whole point that Morrison was making. Um, still, a lot of people call this very very brilliant, but and and myself included. Again, when I sat down to read this, I thought I'm sure parts of this have aged poorly. I remembered the Beast kind of uh, I'm gay, not not gay kind of tone deaf stuff. The the nine eleven bad timing, but. I was surprised at how much of a chore it was to read this and not in, not in a good way. Yeah. Yeah. It's incredibly poorly paced. Um, I forgot how poorly paced this comic was, um, you know, and, and again, it's a lot of the retreading, a lot of the really great ideas that Grant doesn't focus on and moves on to the next idea before giving us any closure or truly developing the idea that came before it. The, the Quentin Quire stuff, I get why people really latch onto it because it's some of the best stuff in this book and not enough time is spent on, on really developing all of that, like in the background and, and setting up this riot at Xavier's. Uh, I feel like my brain acted like in remembering it, that there was more going on in the background, but it's actually very abrupt. Yeah. And there was only like six members of the riot. That's the crazy thing. It's like, you can't really call riot six people. Even if, like, if one of them is like multiple man, that's a whole other story. Sure. But it wasn't, this is a, it, it, like the idea of like him, you know, Quentin building up a group and that group expanding and like kind of like, yeah, he's right. Xavier wants us to help out humanity. Where were they when like 16 million of us are dying? And then like someone points out, yeah, it was a mutant. I did it. It was his sister. It's like, yeah, exactly. Look at that. And he's, he's letting his sister live. They should, like, Sandra should a lot die. Them. A, a lot like, there's so much them. potential and they could have sewed out. Like, I, I would love to see that B plot of this groundswell like maybe even somebody mentions to xavier it's like uh, we got a problem growing here you need to do something about it like, we can't we can't you know like this idea of uh, uh we can't repress their regret that was just something magneto would do da, 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 you know whatever and it's you know like these kids like you start seeing the magneto is right you know and mm -hmm. this growing subculture of you know why should we go hand-to-hand -hand with mutants we're we are the future 
you know, it's like the, you know, where the future Charles, not them, they no longer matter. You know, the whole, uh, the X-Men yeah. movie, which is like the idea of forcing evolution upon like, you know, whatever other, you know, baseline, you know, flat scan humans, but none of this is actually the inconsistent tone and the inconsistency is the, is the key word for this entire story. 114 onward. And this inconsistent tone hurts it so much. And even with likes of, Quietly doing some of his best work, and you got sure. Phil Jimenez, and you know you, you know, uh, and, and I still, I'm like, I feel so bad for Igor Kudai because uh, what happened? And apparently, uh, there was an interview I was reading. This is like after I, I think it was before or after I, I, re, I read the omnibus, but he was ta- from like November, like t- 2007. Is like he was so weirdly, or 2007 or 2001, I believe, um, talking about how you know, as as people, as you know, like you know post September 11th and all this and that told me also how Marvel kind of screwed him. Like he signed a contract. This was the page rate. And then like, okay, we're going to lower your page rate. And if you don't like it, then you can quit, but we'll sue you basically. It will boil down to, it's like, if you don't like this page rate, don't do it, but we have lawyers and you don't, and we call and we just drag it out in the course. He's like, do it or don't. And so I was like, man, that sucks. Like you, you, you have a contract to guarantee, but that don't mean nothing because they got lawyers. And I was like, that's terrible. <laughs> but then in reading the, the Casada, uh, the arrogant interview, or you know, oh, oh, we, oh, we don't know what you're talking about. We don't got weed, and you know, coming onto yeah. the book, yeah. it just goes to show you, like, you cannot trust these people. And I was like, it, well, this, all this kind of maybe just this. Is why I would never want to work for Marvel or DC. <laughs> but, but you have um, uh, not only the retreading of, of the older material, you, you have retreading within the volume. You have the riot at Xavier's with with a group of students who want to kill humans, and then you just do that again a few issues later with Zorn's class. Right. It's it, it it's just very poorly paced out. It's like it doesn't make sense. Why wouldn't after something like that happened, Xavier and the rest of the X Men be like kind of clamping down on on that kind of behavior? Yeah. No. It. it the the pacing is really weird, and there's been a lot of uh, I don't know articles written and, and kind of theories that you know that Marvel did screw, kind of like you were saying, Larry and, and Joe, that Marvel uh, screwed Morrison, that they deliberately kind of uh, found ways to kind of attack him. They were trying to build up at the time uh, Bendis and and uh, Miller, and you had uh, you had some other people kind of coming into the picture, and that, that Marvel's interest faded. But and and I think lack of editorial direction was definitely a big here, deal here but it, it just it it feels like on several different stages from both Morrison and the editors and a lot of the people involved they just they kind of gave up on some of this book like the editors were not stepping in to go hey this isn't something you should do and Morrison was disgruntled and so he was just kind of doing whatever he wants and he wasn't worrying about it and it felt like there was like there was no adult in the room to say hey uh you know, this is a big franchise book for us. Let's make sure that these ideas go somewhere. Let's make sure we don't repeat the same storylines four issues later. Let's uh, let's let's be cautious and let's not have the same villain we've had for the past you know forty years. You know, let's not do yeah. Magneto again. And yeah. I well, honestly was- think that they're like if, uh, good editors, good control in hand, and also maybe like playing that, like you said, hey, let's let's explore this. Like, can we introduce this a little bit earlier? These ideas, like you know, you know talking to them, working with them, and then you know the playing devil's advocate and like i'm you know i'm trying to think okay let, let's say i was morris and i come onto the book you know and like you know i'm also pitch some other ideas and do some other things they don't want none of that they just want my casada just wants my name that's it he just wants to be able to say look what we did we got this from dc it's the the cock of the walk like it's you know you don't love this woman she's beautiful but you're just you want to say i got her and you can't have her that's how you that's how it almost feels like it does it feel like that. And, and yeah. the, the, the feeling to it and and yeah. then maybe he realized that like halfway through the run, it's like, why do I care? Like they, you know, and so he just you know, <laughs> jumped back to DC and like, wasn't Morrison a part of the, that failed Superman pitch with uh, Miller and he was, and that was, part of, yeah, that was part of at least the theory of one of the, the things that caused him to leave was kind of how that all went down. Um, why he left DC, but, but within, within the year, I mean, if you think about everything, it was a race. So, well, maybe it took more than a year, but, you had um, you had Whedon come in, give him costumes, and kind of eliminate that part of his legacy. You had the Scarlet Witch uh, take out kind of all, all most of the mutants, which undid 
what Morrison was trying to do in terms of building up a lot more of new mutants and kind of new era. You had that, that happen. You had the beast kind of get reverted. You had, I mean, they kind of went through everything. Magneto. Excalibur showing up, uh, Magneto showing up and Excalibur. Yeah. It wasn't the real Magneto. It was a different Magneto that actually did this thing in New York. And just, it's, it's like they kind of went down the line and erased pretty much everything. They, they kept the, the Scott Emma relationship. Um, but beyond that, I mean, like Quentin Quire's powers are seem radically different by the time the next time they really started using them again. Yeah, I, I mean, but, nothing really stuck. No, and, and then you also have instances where it's like Marvel editorial just going back to the well again. Like, oh my god, we had a character commit genocide. I know it wasn't that character. Yeah, <laughs> it's like you, you guys have done that already. Like, <laughs> it's it's mind boggling how how much money they threw at revamping the X-Men and not revamping it at all. Right. Yeah. At the end of the day and this run, you know, when uh, Hickman was coming on to do uh, X-Men, they talked about, you know, Morrison's run being one of the, the kind of the, the, I think four key moments. I think he listed the, the origin point and then, Claremont with giant size and then Morrison and then his run. It'd be like the fourth major change for the title, but it, it really wasn't, it, it wasn't that much of a change. I think it, you look at it through kind of rose colored glasses and you see this Ruby quartz glasses, maybe yeah. uh, there you go. <laughs> Ruby <laughs> quartz uh, contact lenses. Contact lenses. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's just, it's amazing that this, this run is viewed as such a major you know, shift a status quo shift for the title, but on all fronts, they, they ran away from it as fast as they could. And it didn't, it didn't stick. It's, it's just, it's a very strange outcome for this, this run that I think a lot of people think of as core to the entire. Yeah. And, and and I feel like, and I know Larry was talking before about um, liking, you know, stuff that Grant's done before. And, uh, Uh you know, for me, um, I, I, I've read more recently, uh, you know, is animal ran run doom patrol uh, Arkham asylum. All three of those for me are, are fantastic. I, I sat and read Arkham Asylum twice in one sitting when I first got it. And I never do that. Yeah. You know, it's just, a, it's a gorgeous book. It was a great book uh, to me. I I've read the doom patrol run, uh, multiple times. I own an original page from that run. Um, yeah. y- you know, uh, a- animal man, um, you know, I, I, for me, Doom Patrol edges it out a little bit. I know a, a lot of people say it's Animal Man hands down, but I, I think there's an argument to yeah, be Doom had Patrol there. I agree fully. Doom Patrol is better. It's yeah. better, better characters, it, yeah. better written, better world. Yeah. And the ideas, while bizarre and strange, you know, if you go back and look, you know, like look at the Silver Age Doom Patrol stuff. It mm-hmm. was that was bizarre and strange for the time. You get any stranger, then you're like, okay, this is some subversive stuff. We're gonna shut it down. But yeah. It was, you know, Grant at his most Grantness without having to ins- literally insert himself in the ki- in himself. He's done it before, with, yeah. like King Mob and everything like that. And it was good. But this, like as they say, this ain't it, Chief. You know, New X-Men ain't it. It's like you yeah. I would not recommend New X-Men to any, like, oh, we want to get into X-Men. I would not recommend New X-Men. If anything, I'd honestly say go read Ultimate X-Men because at least Miller... Yes, his is you know more in, in many ways more cynical, but it sets the world up. And I mean, you know, granted that's the whole point. It was the, the ultimate line, but the costumes look more like you know they're black, you know they're black and yellow, and they're kind of militaristic looking, uniform looking. The characters aren't exactly the same, but it, it's a like, Miller did a better job with Beast, did a better job with Gene, did a better job with everybody else. Granted, this is supposed to be their first outing into this world. But as far as the reads go, and they're, you know, uh, contemporaries, because I think Ultimate X Men was up to, I'm, I'm not mistaken, I believe I got issue six of Ultimate X Men the same time I got uh, New X Men number 114. And I think I think Ultimate X Men was uh, like already out at that time. It was, yeah. They, um, it had been running and, and they were putting some of that work together, yeah. Yeah, but it was it was contemporary to it, and like it was a better read, better done. Magneto was a villain, but they didn't just linger on that. You know, well, they did bring him back. You know, the mind wiped and brought him back. This that whatever, which is very in tone in line with the movies. Uh, but 
everything else. Like there was a lot of good stuff in that run. I can't say the same for new X-Men and I'm, it, it, it disappoints me because yeah. there's a lot of potential there, but it's such a waste of honestly everything. You know, expanding on Wolverine's origins, uh, the potential of the school. Uh, you know, like the, the I always thought, like, and this is my personal look at Cyclops. The idea of this, you know, kid, he could easily, if it wasn't for finding a purpose with, you know, fighting, you know, for Xavier's dream, because it wasn't he wasn't doing it for himself; he was doing it for Xavier. Uh, he could easily ended up like a school shooter or something, or somebody like a villain. And this idea of like. The happening when your school was supposed to be running at efficiency and you're letting this happen because you just got letting too many things go on. Such a waste of potential with Quentin and co. Yeah. Cool. I, um, I would say something like this. Um, if you are a Grant Morrison fan and not an X-Men fan and want to read X-Men, I could see recommending this because it's very yeah. Grant Morrison. Um, yeah. You know, beyond that, if you want to get into X-Men, you know, I have a hard time not just saying um, get the Uncanny X Men Volume One Omnibus. Um, the fourth one's coming out soon. That's four omnibuses. You're you're going to be set for a while. Yeah, and that's that's the better place to go. I, I don't think this this run. I, that's 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 right. Like you, I think Doom Patrol, Animal Man. I I think his Batman run actually does uh, ages a lot better than this, and mm-hmm. and it's a lot more coherent. I'll have um, to I'll have to disagree on that. The Ninja yeah. Man bats the the pro story. <laughs> the pro story. I was like, what is this garbage? And, yeah. and, and the shop. The shop would not like. It's like oh, you, know, we, you have this yeah, cool but, list. They wanted me to pay for that. I'm like, no, I'm not paying for that. That's not a comic book. <laughs> keep in mind where, what we just went through, but okay. I'll, I'll, <laughs> true, true, true. Well, well, I, your opinion, but I mean, well, okay, um, well, okay. It's I'll put it this way. At least, at least we had the you know, pretty consistent art on that. That, so that, is, that. that is true. <laughs> I think that uh, it is. It's it's a tough place to begin. If you're an X Men fan, uh, certainly you've been wanting to pick this up. I, I think if you're a current fan of Hickman's run. I, I, I think this would confuse the living hell out of you coming to this. I, I, I know a lot of people who are, who are kind of newer to the X-Men and they've come in in the last you know year or so and and they, they hear this, oh, there's a lot of this was inspired by the Morrison run. That would be a bad trip, I think. I, I'd, I'd actually love to meet the person who started with Hickman's X-Men recently and then went back and read this. I, I can only imagine what kind of crazy thoughts are going through your head. But <laughs> uh, anyway, it's, it's so kind of... Eh. I want to thank you guys. We we went through this. Uh, took took a few hours, but it was worth it. Um, yeah, there's a no lot of comic there. Last thoughts or any any last pieces? We we uh, kind of been going through it. I'll say I'll say this. It's like if you like if, if you like, you should be hurt by by a story. <laughs> New X Men oh, no. for you because it's I I I, I honestly feel, honestly I feel betrayed. I feel betrayed by it. <laughs> okay. Because I, my memory of it is one thing and then rereading it was a whole other. And I used to, and, and also it's like very, it just, I know quietly probably did those pages for the, for one fifteen and one sixteen, the lead up to the whole attack on Genosha. But dear Lord, as far as a lot of synchronicity stuff goes with September 11th, that, that was, was yeah. that's, and then uh, the, the can't blame Marvel the for that one, but man, that was, yeah. Some bad. Yeah. <laughs> it's a rough one and it's like you know ugh, but yeah <laughs> pain I, I, do, <laughs> I do hear you and 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 joe i think you had the same so i know we were talking uh yeah. along the way is like it is weird when you have good memories of something and then you go back and you read it and you're like oh and it's it's not just like oh this kind of age bad it's like oh what why is this taking so long like this i yeah. just supposed to be fun <laughs> this this was um uh, harder than uh, Whedon's Astonishing X Men. Oh yeah, yeah. you know uh, I, I. As much as I was like, oh, this this isn't as good as uh, I remember it being. It kind of ended there instead of it being like this was like a genuine like slog. This was uh, mm-hmm. difficult at times for me to get through. Uh, my memory definitely added to things that weren't actually there. Um, yeah, and you know after reading this. Um, I think I would recommend um, if you like Grant Morrison, get his Animal Man or Doom Patrol. And if you like the X Men, uh, read Claremont's X Men Run. That's you know, that's what you need to do. There, there's, I mean, that's it's 
not entirely fair. Uh, I really like um, Peter David's X Factor Investigations. I think um, yeah. if you have the con- if you have the knowledge of uh, House of M, you could even start with House of M and then work through it that way and um, read that run with while also inserting the events of you know Messiah Complex, Messiah War, Second Coming, Schism, and, and stuff like that. That's that's a good to me at least. Uh, uh, X read uh, that's a little more modern if you don't want to go back that far, but um, but but yeah, I, I mean, I, I if you are a diehard Grant fan and you have been chomping at the bit to read X Men, um, this this might be uh, for you, but <laughs> that's probably the only person I would like recommend this to off the bat. Yeah. There's definitely better Grant Morrison for you to do. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, Larry, Joe, thank you very much for spending the time and, and going through this. And uh, and no, for people who are wondering right now, when when uh, Joe and I were teasing a comic that uh, we we absolutely hate that everybody else loves, this was not it. So oh, yeah. No. <laughs> I want to make that clear, too, because like, yeah. I was like, let's do this. Let's do this. And then I, I'm listening to the other retrospectives. Yes, this was terrible, but in a whole other level. I have no clue what they got planned. I don't want to know. No. I wouldn't be surprised. Oh, know. Up. Oh, it's like, oh, you'll know. Like, you'll, yeah. you'll see. It's like oh, you're yeah. the Red Dragon. Yeah. <laughs> you had to light right. me on fire and roll me down the street. <laughs> yeah, gotta gotta start um, shedding those uh, subs. You're getting too many subscribers lately. That's that's true. It's been growing, so we got to get rid of those people. This will yeah. definitely do it. Not this one, but that next one will definitely. I don't know, man. I'm, I'm pretty annoying, so I might drive some people away. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. And uh, for everybody listening, hope you had a good time. I did. I hope you guys did too. And have a good, I have yeah, a good thanks day. Thanks so much. <laughs>